okay, Hachioji was hard, but the season was awesome. It had a story. And I just doesn't have leg power. And she'd be the first to tell you. We might finish setting and taping qualities, let's just say at Thursday night at midnight or 1 a.m., 2 a.m., get to the wall at 7. We're there from 7 until all the way, maybe until, again, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m. Am I good enough? Is this imposter syndrome situation happening? Am I supposed to be here? Welcome to another episode of the That's Not Real Climbing podcast. I'm your host, Jenny, and I'm excited to introduce my guest for today, Cody Grodsky. Cody is the USA National Chief Rod Setter, and in the 2023 IFSC season, he had the opportunity to set boulders in Hachioji, Prague, Innsbruck, and the Burn World Champs. In this episode, we'll watch him read YouTube hate comments, and we'll learn about the differences between IFSC versus USA versus commercial rod setting, as well as hear about his awesome new gym that's opening up soon. I am so excited to visit it someday. This is a super long episode, but there was so much to get into, and he has some serious passion for setting, which is just inspiring to listen to. So please enjoy this episode with Cody and send him lots of thanks for the time he spent with me on this. Hope you enjoy. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay, awesome. Well, let's just get right into it then. Um, yeah, how are things going? Are you preparing for your upcoming trip to Europe for the selection comp? I am, yeah, yeah. Just uh, slowly starting to pack my things and get everything organized. But, um, you know, I, I travel quite a lot, so it's it's kind of the same the same uh, strategy each time. So nothing, yeah, you've got the crazy. routine down. Yeah, exactly. So I guess getting right into it a bit, when did you start climbing and route setting? Uh, let's see. So funnily enough, I started climbing and route setting and working at a climbing gym all like almost in the same day. Um, not exactly, but but like for sure, um, like route set. Yeah, I mean, within maybe a, f- a few days or something like that. Like it was all pretty, pretty much all at the same time. Um, I started climbing about 16 years ago and so i've been setting for about that long and then just due to the nature of like when i started at this uh climbing gym in town they happen to be having a um, usa climbing regionals and so i got to like forerun for forerun like i had any concept of what that meant right like, i was just like they're like oh there's there's people here setting competition routes like they invited us if we want to like help them test and i was like okay like uh, I'll, I'll help, you know? And so kind of right out of the gate, um, got involved in just pure luck, you know, just completely pure luck that it happened that way. Uh, uh-huh. like right when you started climbing? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I was fooling around. I mean, I went, you know, I guess what, when, when did we, any of us like start climbing? Like when I was two years old or four years old, probably I went to like a carnival and did one of those like okay. rock walls. Uh-huh. Right. But like, I don't consider that the start of climbing any more than like I had a birthday party at a climbing gym when I was a kid. Um, you know, had someone belay me and my friends for a couple hours, you know, is that maybe that's the start of the climbing? I don't know. So I guess it depends when I, when I started to like actually get like into it and like, like I want to go to the gym and I want to participate in this community. That was all kind of at the same at the same time. Yeah. Well, it's just kind of like strange that they would ask someone who's still fairly new to climbing that they would ask them to start to like forerun or route set at all in any capacity, um, unless you were just like really good when you started. <laughs> no, no, no. I'm very much on the contrary. Terrible terrible uh i think though it's just like probably pretty indicative of the community up here um in southern new england um and it's you're also talking almost two decades ago right like the climbing landscape has changed so incredibly much um it was very very tight-knit for every you know new climber in in a facility there was 15 mentors you know now you have every 15 new climbers you might not even have a, a mentor so i I think I just got really lucky in that way where the community was like very excited and very open. And they were like, Oh, here's someone new that seems like they're wanting to share this passion with us, you know? And I did, I didn't realize how much so, but they helped foster that. 
And I think they're like, oh, if we just show them this and show them that, then maybe they're more likely to stick around and, and be involved. And uh, they're right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And so back then, was there a formal process at all to get into route setting or were there these um, I guess clinics and courses that you can take. Cause I know right now in the U S there's like, um, five levels of mm -hmm. route setting. Um, what's the word like certification? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so is that like that, a new thing? Uh, it's not a new thing. So I think I, I should know this. I'm one of the, uh, national chief instructors for USA climbing. I should know all the, know all the history because I have to go over it all the time. But, uh, I want to say it was like, the root setting program, at, you know, and it's like, uh, f it's founding was somewhere around like maybe 2007 or 2008. And that was kind of just like the first, the first iteration of it, right. Of like, Hey, we're formal formalizing this process in some way, shape or form. And I don't even know if there was five levels at that point. I don't remember what the levels were. Um, I do know though, that for this, like they did at least have like local events and then like regional events, maybe they had divisionals and then nationals. Um, so to be the chief of any one of these events, you did have to have some sort of formalized education through USA climbing and exactly what that looked like. I don't, I don't quite know. I think the first level two clinic might've been in 2009 or 2010. So it was all starting to be developed around this time. And I think that's where there was just so many loose ends all over, you know, people could just be involved and, you know, as it's, it's forming, kind of as you go. So it's almost like you can't be too picky if you want the events to occur at various places around the country. And I'm just, I'm just guessing here. I don't know. I've actually never talked to anyone about it. Like really what, what it was like back then um, in terms of specifics for the certification process, but it'd be interesting to talk to someone, maybe like Chris Danielson, who'd be like, uh, just, he started the whole program. So he would be a wealth of knowledge for that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Maybe yeah. I'll have to look into that. Yeah, he's a smart guy. He's a really good. And so I guess out of this, you've kind of managed to make a career out of climbing, which I think is something a lot of people wish they could do. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it's a lot of people's passions. So um, was that like a very intentional um, step for you or did it just sort of happen? Like how you just sort of happened to start forerunning and route setting? Yeah, I think I'm trying to think back here. Um, it was, it was fairly intentional from, I won't say from the get go, I won't say from, you know, day one or even maybe year one, but, um, it pretty, pretty early on, I realized that I was very invested in this whole idea, but I just didn't know what that looked like because there weren't really any careers like there was certainly no like careers in root setting as i knew it at least in my little bubble of where i was here in in like southern massachusetts um and then it wasn't until i went away to school i went to university of new hampshire that i was kind of like oh man um i need to make a decision here like do i keep kind of pursuing this thing that i'm really excited about root setting um like i know i'll have climbing like i, I'll, I know i'll keep climbing i i knew that much but do I keep pursuing root setting and what does that look like? So I just started like Googling like climbing gyms in New Hampshire, climbing gyms in Boston. And, um, uh, long story short, eventually found Metro rock, which, um, maybe folks know, or maybe not is the home of the dark horse bouldering series. And it, in my, in my mind, and maybe this is just me being like, um, I don't know. I have like a deep, deep connection to it because I kind of was there in the, the foundings of it, I, I think maybe from season two until season six. So really the early days and it just like ignited this huge passion for competition, route setting, competition, climbing. Um, they had more of a professional environment for, for commercialized route setting. Um, it was far from perfect. And if you compared it to today's day and age, you'd be like, what is going on? But for that, for that time, it was, very much like top end in a lot of, a lot of metrics. Uh, and it got me super motivated. So, so much so that I went to school at the university of New Hampshire. And then at various points in time, either lived, um, close by to the school, like around the Pawtuckaway state park area. There's a lot of good climbing up there. And then would, uh, commute to work in Boston. Uh, it was like 80 miles each way. And then, uh, or switch, or I was living in Boston and commuting to school and, you know, same number of miles each way. 
um, gosh, yeah. got, got kind of tricky at times and definitely, yeah. Like asked myself, like, what, what am I doing? Like, there's no money in this. Like I'm not getting, you know, I'm having to like pick up coaching shifts and, and coach teams as well as work full time, as well as, you know, travel all this way to school. And, um, yeah, it wasn't without questions. That's for sure. But just kind of was like, you know what, I love this. So I'm just going to keep going for it until the road runs out. And, uh, so far the road hasn't run out. So, yeah, that's awesome. And a lot of dedication. I mean, for like non-Americans, that's probably what, like an hour and a half at least of Mm -hmm. driving every day. Yeah. Uh, to and from yeah yeah at least i mean and depending on boston traffic too i mean when you're in new hampshire it's you know whatever it's just like all pretty open and pretty chill but you get closer to the city and for sure tons of traffic and then uh the weather in new england's pretty wild like you can get um crazy bands of intense snow and, and rain or frost or whatever in one area and then be completely clear or vice versa. So you'd like, I'd be traveling sometimes and they'd be like, Oh, we're not canceling school. And then I'm in Boston and it's like two and a half feet of snow. And I'm like, damn it. <laughs> this, this sucks, you know, <laughs> but you just manage. And uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a drive though, for sure. Yeah. And for those who aren't aware of the dark horse um, competition, I guess people like me, Sure. Okay. Um, yeah, what's yeah. the history? What's the history? I'm definitely not the best person to talk about it, but um, I was involved for a while. So it was kind of this brainchild of um, Josh, Josh Larson, who's now the U.S. team coach, uh, Olympic coach, national coach, and Dave Wetmore, who's um, another level five national chief route setter. He's been involved with the U.S. climbing for a very long. He's been the chief of uh, open boulders. Um, he's been on like every career imaginable and just like integral to the sport so they kind of came up with this concept uh, along with the owners of metro rock and it was kind of one of the more it was like one of the first big scale private competitions with uh, a large cash purse and a dedicated finals round in like a more grand setting um, and so for me it kind of kicked off that you know, kind of competition climbing as we know it, as we see it in today's day and age, uh, a little bit more so. Like I remember for the first time, like it was at one of those competitions where I saw like a true paddle move be set and climbed, you know, and I was like just completely floored. Like I didn't know that, you know, something like this could even exist. And um, the energy and the people, it was, it was like a really special time, at least for me in, in, uh, in competition climbing and route setting. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. I can't, I think probably the first time I saw a paddle move, I was also just like mind blown. <laughs> I was hooked. Um, okay. And then outside of your climbing career, we were talking a little bit about it earlier. You're also a firefighter. Um, and also, I don't actually know. I've like never met a firefighter, I think, outside of maybe when you're like in elementary school mm -hmm. and you are taken on a field trip to like – something like that yeah, yeah, you like yeah. see a fire truck or something um what's that like and how do you manage that along with climbing it's very different in most ways um what's that like yeah i don't know it's a, it's just a completely different world it's i kind of love it because it's just just such an opposite of what i do with climbing um all the guys at the fire station like you know they're just their career firefighters or in construction or they're in, you know, fishing or, you know, any number of, uh, trades. And then they, you know, we do this and to kind of just like help out the town and the surrounding communities and stuff like that. And it's cool because I just kind of can like shut off the climbing brain and I can focus on this other set of skills that are vital to, uh, like success in a different type of career path. Um, started i had no intention like i never was like i never grew up and was like i want to be a firefighter um my wife and i moved up to back up to massachusetts in 2020 uh, we were living in chattanooga for uh, a long while we moved up here and then um yeah kind of long story short they do like fire inspections i guess when you uh purchase a house and the person who's doing the fire inspection was also the captain of the uh department and my brother, I guess, had been trying to get on the fire department and he was like, oh, are you the captain that was doing hiring? And he's like, oh, yeah, like because of COVID, things got crazy, but you should come back to the station and we'll we'll do your interview like this weekend if that works for you. And my brother was like, oh, that's awesome. And then he looked at me and he's like, so uh, what's your story? What are you doing? And I'm like, 
uh, I don't know, I just like moved across the country and uh, like trying to start this like new business concept. And I don't know, like just getting married. Like <laughs> he's like, you should, uh, you should consider being a, a firefighter. And I was like, no disrespect. Like I have no fucking clue about anything to do with the fire service. Like I'm probably not your guy. And um, anyways, yeah, he explained the whole process and the support that the, the town gives and kind of like tangibles of and expectations on kind of either side of things and um just kind of dip my toe in and you know as as i kept going you know coming around and, and moving forward i was like oh this is this is really cool like this is really special and um it's like a really good group of people and everyone's like genuinely there to help like everyone who when you're responding to something it's usually someone's like bad day you know they don't want to call 911 to to I don't, I don't know. People don't want to call 911, right? Like it's like a bad thing. And you're like something, something is occurring that you're like, damn it, this isn't good. So it's nice to be involved in a group of people who are like, yep, like we're here to help and we want to, we want to make a difference and, and try to make your day, you know, at least a little bit better or, or not suck as much as it, it is. Um, so yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild for sure. But I really, I really enjoy it. I don't know if you're recording, recording on the beginning but I don't know when, when you started recording, but like yesterday, like I was saying, like I like woke up at, you know, to, to my pager, I have this like little pager here and it like goes off if there's like a serious thing that they need us for. And they alert us as to like where you're going and what you're doing and what the situation is basically. And like hurry the hell up and get to the station basically. And, uh, that was for a commercial scalloper that caught fire in the town over. And so first thing in the morning, go to the next town over and you see a, pretty big plume of spoke from like, you know, eight miles away. And you're like, Oh, this is going to be a, it's going to be a morning for sure. And, uh, it's definitely a juxtaposition from climbing where climbing can be a lot more peaceful. If you'd like it to be, it can be intense. If you'd like it to be, it can be kind of whatever you'd like it to be because it's your own personal experience. Like climbing is for everyone. Climbing, all types of climbing are valid indoor, outdoor, trad, crazy Cordo Dino, you know, like you get to pick your experience every single time that you like step on the wall yeah that's really cool um i mean both very physically demanding jobs though yeah yeah i'm noticing a theme in my life <laughs> I, could, I could probably pick easier careers in terms of demand on my own body and mind but uh i guess there's something to it for me that i like yeah has it ever i guess like interrupted a route setting gig that you're doing or do you kind of separate those mm. I try to separate them as much as possible. So I do a ton of um, kind of my, my full time gig now is I run a consulting firm for climbing and, and route setting and athlete workshops and wall design, kind of, you know, the whole gamut, anything under the umbrella of artificial climbing wall management in whatever scope um, me and my team kind of work on. So I try to be selective as to when I can schedule certain things, um, whether that be for, you know, the fire department or for, for myself, for this business. But generally speaking, like they're super flexible and it allows me to be, allows me to do kind of both things. I mean, I have minimum requirements I have to meet at the station. I have to, you know, do this type of training this much and I have to meet this many meetings or this many, uh, response, this much response volume each year. You know, there's like things I have to do, maintain certification, education, things like that. But, um, as long as I'm hitting those or exceeding those, then uh, all is well. Awesome. So we've discussed a bit of your route setting career, your firefighting career, um, but this is like a climbing podcast, I guess. So we'll get back into the route setting. Um, so you've discussed a bit about your setting journey in the U.S. How did you become an IFSC route setter? Ooh, great question. And minor clarification or maybe major clarification. So I'm technically not like, a. Uh, I always try to make sure that like, this is like a, people know this, like, so there's like a very, very rigorous and very specific. And then arguably, depending on what you're talking about political process as to like what, uh, who gets their IFSC license. Uh, so it's a very specific thing. So I never want to take credit for that because I do not have that. Um, we do have a couple folks in the U S who do have that, which, uh, is awesome. And, aspiring one day to hopefully get that opportunity. Um, but I've managed to work on a number of international events because there's like certain requirements that say, 
okay, you need to have like this many root setters that are hired and um, hired by the IFSC. And then there's like a number of other slots that basically get filled by the host federation or the event organizer or the head root setter kind of conglomerate. So depending on what their needs are and what they what the expectations are of the event or the event sponsors or the venue itself, I mean, there could be any number of things that might make the event a little bit easier, or a little bit more logistically complex. Typically, if it's a little bit more logistically complex, um, and I'm just like painting broad strokes here, like what I've found is they, will you know, add an extra spot or an extra two spots in the setting team because they're like, oh, things could get crazy. There's more likelihood that like a mistake could be made um, or that the schedule could get shifted or the timelines could bounce around or, you know what I mean? So they try to like, in those situations, like add a couple extra folks. Um, and then who they add is, it's kind of like a three-step process. The chief, chief has to be involved. The event organizer and host federation has to be involved. And the IFC has to kind of sign off on this. Um, so it's it's a little can be get, can be quite complicated to be completely frank and I don't quite know my way around it all, um, but I just put my my hat my name in the hat I guess um, and especially last year it was able it was able to work out quite nicely um, but I had experience prior to that um, so my family's all from Poland I'm a Polish I'm a dual citizen Polish citizen and uh, American citizen and uh, a few years ago well sh shit. Uh, 2016, I went to visit my family in Poland and then also go on vacation and super long story short, ended up setting the European Youth uh, Cup in Warsaw for its like inaugural uh, event, which was kind of just shit luck, to be completely frank. Another just lucky situation, maybe right place, right time. I contacted Chris Danielson, who I referenced earlier. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm going to Poland and visiting my family. I noticed that there's a competition series going on over there. And like, if, you know, I don't know if you know anyone on that, you know, circuit or whatever, but like, I'd be more than happy to just like wash holds or tape or brush or I don't know, whatever, just so I can like see what it's like to be involved in that type of circuit. Um, because at this point, I'd already set for um, numerous regionals, divisionals, dark horse, private comps, had done a number of nationals. Um, so I would like, you know, I kind of, I had some familiarity with the U S circuit and I knew that, okay, there's this other step and I just want to get involved and learn. So I was like, well, you know, I'll go hang out for a little bit, learn from these guys. And Chris, um, you know, he's, he was a super busy guy. Like he didn't really get back to me for a little while. And I'm like, eh, that probably means that nothing's going to happen. And I was a little bit like, eh, well, I'll still go and watch the comp, you know, no worries. Um, and then the day we were leaving, I got a phone call from Chris and he's like, Hey, did you leave yet? And I was like, no, I'm, I'm like literally about to leave to like hop in the car and go to the airport in Atlanta. And he's like, if, do you want to root set for this comp? Because something happened and two of the root setters got injured and they can't find any replacements, like any qualified people. And I was like, uh, yes, yes, I do want to root set for this event. So that's kind of what kicked it off. And then I maintained these contacts and um, worked with these folks in, in other, in other, uh, instances over the years. And yeah, here we are. Okay. Yeah. So not an IFSC route setter, but I guess you kind of just got picked to route set for a few of the competitions. Yeah. I think it's, it's kind of like, kind of like what I was referencing earlier. Like they already had their like official crew of people, but there's like for, uh, for like each event, you know, like let's say the IFSC picks three people, like one chief and two official root setters. Every comp that I was a part of this year had a minimum of eight, eight root setters. So that's five other slots that are getting filled by the host federation. Um, you know, like, so for us, that's USA climbing, right? Or if it's, you know, Japan, it's the Jamesca, JMSCA. Um, and so the chief might say, Hey, you know, you got good recommendations from so-and-so like uh, if you're around and we can get approval um, and the IFSC checks off on this and the event organizer's cool, like maybe you want to come join. You know, so it does require a lot of, uh, I guess, like self-starting, you know? Um, so, you know, like let's say for Hachioji, uh, Remy, you know, messaged me and asked me, Hey, would love, love to have you on the crew. It'd be super nice. I've, I've enjoyed working with you uh, in the past. We worked a couple of events together and uh, he's like, but it's not, it's not just like this, like 
homeboy hookup situation. You can't just like be on the crew because I say that you can be on the crew. Which at first I, I kind of honestly I thought that's what it was. Like it, to be completely frank, I was kind of like that's just what it is, right? Like that's just how this happens, and it's not. It's like it it helps to have contacts, just like any industry maybe on planet Earth, right? It helps to know people who are, have involvement in the thing that maybe you want to be involved in, but it is far from the buck stopping here, so to speak. So f- after that, I had to contact like on my own. I uh, had to contact the event organizer and the director of sport for Japan. Um, and I was like pretty petrified because I had no clue of what this meant. Um, and then um, they had a bunch of internal conversations. I wrote a bunch of emails in Japanese. Uh, apparently, I didn't offend anyone too, too much. Google Translator was my friend. Um, and just to like do the respectful thing, you know, try to do my best there. And then um, once those two things got approved, I guess... IFSC said, okay, cool. Like this is Remy, this is your team. Okay, of all these like check marks been made. Yep, 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 yep. All right. Now you're green light. So that's a little bit of the behind the scenes, but it's not always that way. So this is just my experience. It's not like everyone's experience always. Some some other folks, if you interview them, they might say, like, oh, for me it was different. But um, that was more or less my experience over the past couple of years. Well, it's a very kind of long and windy experience, I guess. I think, yeah, um, yeah like the uh, first guest I had talked to, um, Nicholas, uh, Nikki, if you're familiar, um, he was saying that there was maybe like a, uh, like a Google Sheet kind of deal. And then you like sign up and then they choose people from that. Oh. Um, or like signing up on a Google form or something like that. Something just also very informal and like not a very strict process. <laughs> so now it's become even more confusing for me as to how they choose people. Yeah, maybe. Um, yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to talk to him. I think I'll see him in a couple of weeks. But so I'll ask him about this. Maybe that has to do with their own internal federation selection. So from like a formal federation selection process they might say okay here's our list like we at us climbing we do a version of this right hey based on certification level and experience uh this group of folks is qualified to represent the us so what we're going to do is we're going to have this application window are you you know and and then on that window maybe they maybe they just have a google form you know to represent that application and then from there Maybe like for us, our route setting committee reviews it, and then our VP of sport reviews it, and our CEO of USA Climbing reviews it. And then collaboratively, selection is made based on the best representatives for our country. Um, so I, maybe I would assume that the German Federation does something similarly. Maybe that's what he's referencing, but I don't know. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, maybe one day there'll be like a more formal, I don't even know, some kind of process. Yeah, they're working on it. They're working on it. It's it's sl- slow going, but yeah, one day. So yeah, you've set in a lot of World Cups in the 2023 season. Um, I think it was Hachioji, Prague, Innsbruck, and then also the World Champs in Bern. Um, of those, did you have like a favorite wall that you set on? Ooh, that's a good question. Favorite wall. trying to like think back i don't know they're all like they're all so cool and so special for like totally different reasons um you know the the wall in hachioji i mean like it's it's hachioji japan it's like the world cup in japan for me that's always been on this massive pedestal um i don't know why just like maybe looking back historically like watching those comps i was always just very engaged and always in my mind i was like man be so cool one day to like just have a chance to be a part of something like that so then with that being to like kick off the 2023 season and and to like i had never been to asia before you know for me just like that whole it was the whole combo you know and the wall itself like from like a physical standpoint was like massive we had amazing resources uh jmsca sent us like awesome 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 holds all the hold manufacturers you know they were like just cranking out awesome new shapes. We got, we got a lot of cool new uh, holds to play with and and create some cool, um, cool situations. So that, that's special. Right. But then you could look at all the other ones like Prague and Innsbruck and I mean, burn like 
they're all just so special for their own ways. Burn was cool. It was in this huge venue. One of my personal dreams, like I even had it on a notepad somewhere, like a, you know, journal that was like from years ago. I was like, I just want to set an event in like a huge arena. And I didn't really care really what the arena was or what the event was, but I would look at like Adidas rock stars or like the world cup in, or sorry, the, um, European championships in Munich in 2019, maybe it was. And just seeing like, Oh, they're at the Mercedes arena or something like that. And just being like, that's the pinnacle, right? You have this like, arena for the sport that you're so passionate about. And then to be involved in that. Uh, yeah. Just like sometimes a little overwhelming almost just like stepping back and being like, Holy shit. Like, this is so cool. And got to reel it back in, but you know, it ends up, it, it, it like, it hit me a lot, hit me a lot, a lot of times. So. No, that's really cool. You kind of like manifested it. So that's always, that's always good to hear. Um, but speaking of Hachioji and how much you enjoyed that process, that kind of sounds like it was kind of your favorite based on how you're describing it. Um, it kind of reminded me of one of the comments that I saw in um, YouTube for that competition about the route setting. Um, so I guess we'll sort of segue into this segment where you're going to read all of the hate comments that I picked out for oh, you. Oh, perfect. <laughs> hate comments. Perfect. This is bringing me back to like my commercial route setting days where you get like the little oh, like comments. feedback box. Yeah. <laughs> it's like one out of 15 is like, hey, nice job, guys. Keep it up. And the rest is like, this sucks. <laughs> perfect. Perfect. <laughs> so yeah, we'll get to see in real time what it what it's like when route setters read that. Um, yeah, right. I think it reminded me of this one where I don't remember if I picked it or not, but um, you sounded really excited about Hachioji. And I think one of the comments was like, oh, I think the route setters had like too much time on this one. They like had too much fun with it and it ended up being way overcooked. But let me share the Google Drive with you and then uh, we can open them. Yeah, you can go for it. Okay. The route setting was, one, too hard, especially since the semis already took a toll on basically everyone. Very fair point. Uh, two, not especially effective in terms of separation. Uh, arguable, but fair. Uh, three, not fun to look at. Depending on your perspective, again, arguable, but I see where, I, I see where they're coming from. Um, and then, let's see, every year we seem to get more and more new school setting. Now it's running dinos at about three meter height. So about like nine feet accurate. Uh, so we watched six people, people attempt the same move for about 30 minutes. Great. Why not involve, involve more actual climbing moves? You can still make it look appealing to a casual audience. Make the moves 3D, involve knee bars, hooks, campus moves, etc. There's so much bouldering that will look cool without resorting to parkour so often. Um, cool. I mean, the first thing is that it's nice that they kind of have like a... It's, it's not quite like if-then statements, but it's it's constructive maybe it's a little bit negative but it's not like hate for hate's sake they're not like this sucks you know like i, I run a lot of like clinics and i probably run 12 to 15 clinics a year and it's one of the f things we talk about with giving feedback is like kind of like make it actionable or at least like express yourself why more than just like this is too reachy or this is bad like you know that doesn't help too much but so this person um cedric um had some nice points uh too hard so that's the first point yes absolutely <laughs> no, no doubt uh, at all, numerically or otherwise, that it was too hard, um, especially since the semis already took a toll on basically everyone. And yeah, they're not wrong. Um, first, first comp of the season, we haven't seen a World Cup. Uh, we haven't seen really any high-level route setting or competition climbing since, I mean, Munich, so, uh, like, yeah, Munich was 2022 European Championships. Um, so like myself and a few of the other root setters who were in Hachioji were on that. We hadn't really seen uh, any anything or anyone since then. You watch their, maybe their videos online, like, oh, wow, Yoshiyuki is looking real strong or Miho looks amazing or, you know, Yanya is in peak form or whatever, right? There's all these like things. And then you get to the comp week and you're like, okay, we actually now have to make like pretty real decisions on what we want these moves to look like and feel like and kick it off with a bang and, and meet the obligations of the event while meeting the obligations of the audience. 
Um, and so semis, semis are always hard. Like that's just the way that it is. You kind of have to have it that way to separate, to get as much separation as you possibly can going into finals. And then typically what that does is it allows us to have a better show for finals and we can, we can play a little bit more, um, with movements and, and things like that. If, if we have like a harder semis, but it can bite you in the ass, which it did for us. And that was because we set a really hard semis, um, for both men's men's and women's. And it, yeah, it was just like too much of a, a toll with not a, enough rest, I think for the athletes in between. Um, let's see next point. It's kind of, kind of what we talked about, not especially effective in terms of separation. It's like, we got the separation, right? So separation is, uh, depending on how you want to look at it. Um, maybe they're talking more like relatively speaking, but like objectively separation is like, do we have a ranking one through whatever 50? And we did, we had a ranking, but it just wasn't like the ideal ranking probably because of the way that optically the boulders perform performed. Right. And which kind of then bleeds into like 0.3, which is not fun to look at. And yeah, straight up, it is like not that much fun to watch climbers try and fail, basically pulling off the mats, right. For, minutes at a time. And then you're like hoping, oh, maybe this next athlete will figure it out and they don't figure it out. And you're like, damn it. It's not fun for anybody. The root setters very, 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 very much included. Um, uh, I think that the, <clears throat> the latter points in this conversation or this, uh, comment are a little bit, um, how do I say this? Like, how do I say this without even, I don't um, it's, it's not so, it's not so simple. It's not so simple to just say like, why not just involve actual more climbing moves to appeal to a casual audience and like add a knee bar or a helix or whatever. Every single one of these athletes, like if you look at any world cup semifinals and above for every event, and I don't even care, pick from 2020 onwards, nearly every single one of these athletes minimum climbs eight B boulders minimum. They're like, maddeningly strong they're so good this is their full-time job this is their life this is everything that they work for train for breathe for they have six opportunities per year to give their absolute all there's just like really not an effective feasible way to put very straightforward traditionally set rock climbing moves on the wall and achieve that ranking and uh, visual appeal. Um, it, it gets to the point where it's, it's, it's quite ineffective. I think actually you still need to represent physical style. You still need to represent climbing style. I'm not, don't get, don't get me twisted. That's not what I'm saying that like, Oh, all these moves needs to be parkour. Or all these moves need to be like crazy, crazy things, but we have to introduce the, the concepts of risk intensity and complexity in a very, uh, particular and exciting way for both the athletes and the audience to make sure that we get that separation in that amount of time. Because if we don't, uh, if we don't play with those other lever le levels of risk and complexity, and we just lean on intensity, you kind of end up with a situation of a yes or no, or a black or a white or a zero or a one, either do the move or don't do the move. And there's no chance of like, uh, creating any sort of crescendo effect. Like if you, you kind of saw this maybe at the world cup in Prague, there was a couple boulders that we set that were like the intensity driven boulders and literally nobody, but like Yanya could touch them because nobody was straight up strong enough to pull on those holds. So it was like kind of cool in a way. Cause you're like, Oh wow, look how much stronger Yanya is than the rest of the field. Great. But then you're still having the same situation occur where you're having five other people prior or 19 other people prior, depending on the round, kind of like try fail, try fail, try fail, because it's just a yes or no question. There's no way for them to get better and learn the movements in any amount of time. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I guess in the Yanya situation, um, or I guess on the men's side, I don't think there's like one guy that stands out as being so much stronger than anyone else. So, mm hmm I would agree with that I th for most things. I mean, there definitely are stylistic climbers more so on the men's side. Um, whereas the women's side, you kind of have Yanya traditionally on all styles, maybe not so much slab, but even then she's really good. Um, and then there's a hyper competitive field with the women below that two through 
15 or something like that. Um, so yeah, it's great, great feedback though, for sure. And it's not something that we didn't think about. We basically, <clears throat> the summary of this is that we pushed too many new concepts too frequently right out of the gate. That was it. This like crazy parkour thing that they're referencing. I think it was men's three, but it was, uh, it was teal volumes and yellow holds. And it was like a pretty difficult and tricky move around the left side of the arete. And then you ran it like, yeah, probably two and a half meters did this like crazy parkour. I mean, it wasn't parkour as much as it was like a paddle dyno, but it was like multiple hand move paddle while also timing the feet quite high. And I think it was just too late in the boulder to push that much. And if you, because if you get it wrong and you go too easy, then everyone just like stops and skips, stops and skips. And you saw this a couple times in Maringen, and I think in 2020 one or 2022 where there's a couple of instances of that where they like they aired on the side of a little bit of caution to see more tops or more zones but then there were a notable number of instances where they the climbers were like stronger than the boulder and they kind of it didn't look as exciting for the for the audience especially too and then they got even less separation because they just kind of all ran it i see so I think, yeah, another big one was probably the last boulder, which was M4 with the jump into the press. But yeah, now people are used to that. So I think it's, it's, uh, oh man, it's, it's like, that's a boulder now where I just like, I would love, and there's no way to do it, but I would love to like get all those athletes back on the wall, four on, four off, put that same boulder on the wall and then see what the results would be um, because of the familiarity. And we got a chance to do that uh, in Bern. And we saw it wasn't identical by any uh, by any stretch, but it was a very, very similar style of move. And we saw, I think, three of six got zone and two top. And one person was actually getting, oh, there was a fourth person, I believe it was Nikolai, got really close to getting zone. So you almost had four of six. Um, whereas you saw zeros across the board for Hachiochi. Yeah, it was very confusing to see, but I guess pretty much a brand new move. I don't think we had seen it before. Yeah, brand new move, I think, especially at that level. I mean, maybe, maybe I would imagine just like the probability is that someone has fooled around with that move somewhere in the world um, and maybe set a version of it, but not on that type of scale and that type of purity. I mean, that was also maybe the problem is that there was no way around it. It was, you had to do this and it was like just so complex because, and the complexity was high because you'd never seen it. So how do you know what you don't know? You know, when we were testing it, it felt like bananas for so long. And then all of a sudden we just like took a break, got a coffee, put on some music and then Sergio did the move. Remy did the move. I did the move. Literally. I have like a video. It was like a running video of just like bang, bang, bang. And we were like, what? We've been working on this for two hours, tinkering, whatever. And then it's, it's been right here, like the whole time. And I think we undersold that aspect of it. To be completely honest, we were like, Oh, well we, who the hell are we? Like they'll definitely figure like it's Mejdi Schalk. He's, I uh, you know, we didn't know at the time, but he's like an Olympian now, right? You have like the, you have the best athletes in the world. They're, they're way better, but we didn't uh, effectively turn the dial uh, appropriately for the four minute window uh, that they had for onsite and the fact that it was so, so, so new. Yeah. So that was the first comment for Hachioji. And then I'll put images up of the comments as well as the boulders um, for people who are watching on video. So you can see that. Um, let's actually move on to the uh, Hachioji Men's 3. So this was the one I was talking about. Um, this one says, I just wish the setters would tone down the insanity next World Cup. They might have had too much free time. They convinced themselves their boulder problems are possible in four minutes. Yeah. I mean, I think I kind of hit, hit on that at the end there a little bit. Like, definitely, I'll say this. It was 100% not too much free time. Uh, that was one of the more time-restricted events due to the location of where we were hosting it. We were forced to, we couldn't enter the facility before a certain time and we had to leave the facility by, I think it was 10 PM every single day, which typically we have until there's no limit. I mean, we'll be, we'll be at the wall until 1 AM, 2 AM, 4 AM. Um, like it's yeah. Like, and it's not like, because, Oh, we're like 
just sitting there tinkering. It's like the the work has to get done and to to dial this right. That's just what it takes a lot of the time. So we didn't have we did not have too much free time. If anything, maybe if we had more free time uh, or more time in general, we would have been able to calibrate a little bit better. Um, I would say that that could be a thing. But uh, we did definitely convince ourselves that the boulder problems were possible in four minutes uh, because we wouldn't have left them on the wall otherwise. <laughs> we don't we don't want to like see a bloodbath uh, of athletes. Like we want to create uh, an environment where all the athletes have the best opportunity to to showcase their skills and succeed, and it's up to them to make that happen. That's what we want to see. And in the ideal world, you have this perfect crescendo and everyone's like getting closer and, and higher and there's this battle and there's this back and forth and who's going to win it. You know, like that's super cool. Like everyone loves that. Um, yeah, we, we, uh, we missed the mark on that one. So, but how do you know until you try? And sometimes you, you just don't. And, and I think sometimes you need to have these events that pushes things because we pushed things. And I think it allowed for like a pretty cool season. Like on the whole, like, okay, Hachioji was hard, but the season was awesome. It had a story. Like if you look at the season, like I'm sure Matt Groom uh, could do, he's like awesome at this shit. He could probably put together a really cool 2023 story, you know, about all the feelings and the emotion and the timeline. And you don't get that from having identical, perfect events. Because then honestly, I think the sport becomes kind of boring you know like if it's always if you always know what's going to happen then why the hell are you watching yeah good point hachioji men comment for that i took um just a couple i guess like the first sentences i wanted to go over um i feel like at least two setters should have to be able to top any set also it would be nice to see a top from the setters during the boulder preview Ooh. i don't know what they mean exactly by to top any set but uh, I guess like go. top any of the boulders. Yeah, like all these, all, like all the moves went. Somebody did. Somebody did the moves. Mm-hmm. Maybe that was me. Maybe that was Remy. Maybe that was Olga. Somebody did something at some point in time. And most of the time, I'll say it is one to three people. Any more than that, it's unreasonable. You're wasting skin. You're wasting energy. Mm-hmm. We should be good enough at our jobs to like evaluate a setter's performance and how they're moving on the wall and be able to provide and use feedback from from our standpoint as well as what the setter is feeling while they're testing on the wall um there are unique situations where we'll lean on one person because it might be an extremely uh hyper specialized skill set right or it could also be like we're super running low on time or we're super running low on energy or skin and like hey Ginny, you have this move dialed. Can you just like keep running this and and we can keep tinkering and then, okay, uh, Cody, you can try the different ways to cheat it because you're finding this strange way that only you or someone who's climbs like you can cheat it. So like we'll play off of one another. You know what I mean? So, but that's not to say that that's, that's the exception. That's not the rule. So a lot of times we do actually we do, I mean, we do these moves. We're not, we're not ever sending a boulder though. We don't ever, there's, unless we're like chilling and like things are great and we have like free time. No one's ever, like Sergio always says, it's like, okay, one more time for the culture, for the culture, you know? And he's like, it's like a funny thing. Like he just, cause he wants to be a better climber and he wants to be, you know, to learn these things. But like that happens this much. Like we just don't have the time or the energy to, to invest into like full sense. Mm-hmm. So we have to calibrate our experiences based on the sections and all the sections go and all the boulders, they go for sure. Mm -hmm. They go, but we could be asking too much at certain times Uh, or not enough or not enough. Hachioji was too much. Um, (laughs) It would be cool to see like top from the setters during boulder preview. But to be frank, that's a lot to ask. I mean, any of these weeks, if they're talking about it live, there's just no fucking way. There's just Mm -hmm. no way to like go out during whatever finals or, and like at that point, you've already, I mean, some of those days, let's say for qualies, we might finish setting and taping qualies. Let's just say at Thursday night at midnight or 1 a.m., 2 a.m., get to the wall at 7. We're there from 7 until all the way, maybe until, again, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., between stripping the wall, after we watch everyone climb, then strip the wall, then put up semis and make adjustments for semis, then tick, tape, tighten those, right? then you're 
back on the wall three hours later to watch or four hours to watch semis. And then you watch, you know what I mean? Like it just ends up, and that's not including the entire week prior. You're just like, that's not our job is to like, the, it's the job of the athletes to perform. It's not the job of the setters to like show the athletes how to do it. Cause if I could just, if I, after a 70 hour work week like that, I could just fire boulders on command. I promise you I wouldn't be root setting and I would be climbing in a world cup. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would be, I'd try to be an athlete. And I guess like it wouldn't really, I mean, usually the athletes top it. So don't really need to see a route center top it. I guess it was just in this one instance where nobody had topped and people really wanted to see what was going on. Yeah. I think, I don't know when that comment was like posted or whatever, but I did post it. Like I'd never posted reels before on Instagram. I didn't really know how they worked, but I made a reel. Um, and it like showed the moves. It was like a, it's, I've been doing it for each world cup now. It's like testing versus setting or sorry, testing versus athletes or something like that. I forget what I titled it. Um, so it just takes an event, takes just random highlight moves, basically more or less if I had my camera running or not, which sometimes I do. And sometimes I don't. And, um, it's like, Hey, here's somebody on the team doing a move or not doing a move depending. And then like, here's the athlete doing the move or attempting the move in a different way or the same way. And like seeing like a before and after, um, and it, people seem to like it. Like, it's kind of cool. It's kind of, I think it's like, I think it's fun, you know? And it shows that like, Hey, yeah, like we actually do this and, uh, we try our best and it's definitely, we're not trying to like screw people. We're trying to create great fields and great moments. Like it's, we're definitely not root setting in any way, shape or form for like the money or the fame because that just doesn't exist. So we're just, we just love it. We're passionate about it. And so just like to share that with people, I think is, is the number one thing. Yeah, I'll link that uh, first video um, in the show notes for people to see. Um, but okay, moving on to Prague, I think also men's. Uh, so Prague men's two. This one says, maybe the setters saw M4 and misread it as V4. Oh, I remember this one. Yeah, I had a lot of involvement in this one. <clears throat> that one was tough. Um, the summary is that conditions matter we were forerunning this boulder um we had to have a, a screen cover up that was part of it so it was like an open air venue we had to keep a screen cover up otherwise everyone would see us testing and forerunning including athletes and coaches and people could video like people walking by the street so there was that and then it was also probably like <clears throat> 85 degrees with no wind so you add that to it and it was like a literal oven in this venue. And even at sometimes we tried to move the screen around or whatever, it just didn't matter so much. It was so absurdly hot during the days that like there were some uh, very, very strong root setters on this team. And they were like having trouble dead hanging certain holds, just like holding them, right? Much less like moving to and from them. And we were actually quite worried for that entire round that we were way overcooked the round especially M- m4 i was like we you know sometimes we'll like place uh like estimations or predictions on the on how we think the round will go and i think every root setter had like men's four as like i don't know if it goes like it goes but i don't know if they'll do it you know what i mean like we're going to create a moment where someone's going to do this move and that's going to be the reason that they get gold and boy oh boy was that not the case uh the temperatures dropped I mean, they it had to have gone down till I we should we should look and see. It felt freezing. People were in like sweatshirts, puffies, gloves, hats. The like people in the in the uh, crowd. You know what I mean? It was it was frigid, and it made the entire world of a difference. Um, that fiberglass, just like I mean, if anyone's ever climbed on sandstone, whether that's like at Font or at Horse Pens or in Chattanooga or anything like, you know, where you have like slopey sandstone the fiberglass can feel sometimes similarly to that or at least how your skin and your hands and your body reacts to that if it's really hot and greasy and sweaty you know about it if it's cold and sticky and almost feels velcroy again you know about it so that's a tough one to to deal with but you know sometimes that's just the game we play and i don't know if there's a great solution on how to fix that but we could probably try to be more, if nothing else, a little bit more aware. I won't say shy away from certain moves, but just be more aware that like 
these situations could occur if, you know, the weather is this or the conditions are that. So do you look at the weather of the day of the comp when you're setting? Yeah. Yeah. Um, a big part of the thing that we didn't pay attention to was the wind. The wind picked up quite a bit too. So it was like whatever, however many degrees, which was like much colder, but not that much colder. But then you added no wind to a ton of wind. I mean, we were like, everyone there was in tank tops or sh in shorts with maybe no shirt on or something like that and pouring sweat. Couldn't even keep chalk on the hands. And then, like I said, you know, you fast forward 12 hours or whatever it is. And before you know it, you're like completely bundled up like a, you know, <laughs> like you're going out to brave the North. And uh, yeah, so yeah, a little bit of a miss there. But I think we still got the separation for the round. Yeah, good to know what you were hoping to see. Because that makes a lot more sense for like the last boulder that you would want it to be hard and show separation yeah. so that that makes a lot of sense yeah um okay let's do prog bends for that photo um are they bad at calibrating the difficulty of static climbing to the climbers when they don't have a million dinos it's nice to see some more strong and static climbing again at least hope that keeps up and they figure out the difficulty um also really felt like there should have been one or two more moves on M4. Um, I think this one they're talking about M3. Yeah. If they're talking about M3, I'd say I think we kind of nailed that one. If I remember, that was the slab. Yeah, I think they liked that one. But then it says they're bad at calibrating the static. Uh, I'm not really sure what this, this comment... Yeah. Because I think maybe we, it was a different boulder. Maybe it was, um, but it's kind of like a reference. I mean, we're trying to create a really diverse uh, field of play. You know, like if if Cody and Ginny are are our field, and Ginny is really really good at Cordo Dinos, and Cody's really really good at Slab, and the root setters put even accidentally they put like two of the four boulders are more slow and static and slabby, and maybe only start to zone is a cordo move then the likelihood is that if all other things are remaining equal cody has a massive advantage at this competition and Ginny has a hard time so we try mm -hmm. to create a fair field of play throughout start to zone zone to top you know at different points throughout the wall um i would like to think we're not bad at calibrating difficulty but maybe some folks think that in certain instances um and we can always be better if nothing else that's that's for sure we can always we can always get better and for the record that's not the reason why i would do worse on a <laughs> comp holder <laughs> in case anyone was wondering um and then for prog women's um there wasn't much in the comments except for congrats for orianne who i think won that one instead mm -hmm. of yanya um and i think you wanted to talk about this a bit which was why you think she managed to win that comp over yanya um oh yeah so i think that this is kind of like a testament to i think we had a quite nice round actually in terms of diversity of style um and it, it allowed orion to shine through i mean it wasn't a perfect round there were again there were some things that i think if we looked back we would have liked to see maybe a little bit differently but the way that the round played out again all the athletes are climbing on the same boulders and the best climber won that day and the best climber was orion and uh orion topped this slab in like the most graceful beautiful style that i've seen someone climb a slab in a really long time uh it was really really impressive she smashed it and i was it was kind of a moment i was like i think she came out don't quote me on this i think she came out last i think she came out like she was in sixth place. So I mean, she came out first, actually, is what I'm trying to say. And I, I watched it and I was like, shit, this folder is way too easy. We're going to have like people just go through this thing. And it was not the case, Orion. It just like really showcased how exceptional she is at this style of climbing. Um, and then you get to Yanya. And uh, if I remember correctly, Yanya did not do the boulder. Um, so there was con conversation um, 
during the comp that, that might have had to do with uh, her foot injury. You know, I dealt with a foot injury, which is also why she wasn't in Hachioji or in Salt Lake. She had like, I think she like broke her toe or something like that. <clears throat> and you could see it. I think even the, I was watching the shoes that she was putting on and she had like hyper stiff shoes um, for the slab. And I, and I think it was to protect her foot, protect her, you know, her toe, but it, that combined with maybe sensitivity or maybe even hesitancy on if she was ready for that. I don't know. Um, she just didn't do the boulder. She always wears um, yeah. like the five ten high angles, though, right? And that is a stiff shoe. Um, maybe that maybe that actually has nothing to do with it then. But watching her on it, like it seemed like you know she had like an ice skate on comparatively to to Orion. Um, so that was really cool to see. And then they both. Um, did Boulder Four, which is like that like Cordo campus thing. The top was maybe a little bit too easy. I think, if, or wait, that was maybe that was Boulder Two. Either way, there was a black and yellow Cordo Boulder. That was, I think, the other like determining factor that they both topped. And I think had that Boulder been a little bit harder, um, you would have seen Yanya maybe win because then Yanya topped the most physically demanding Boulder, um, and she did that in like just incredible style. She like really set herself apart in terms of the raw power. But I think that was kind of cool because like the determining factor for me in that, in that round was like, it's, it's showing that climbing is, it's not unilateral, right? It's, it's multifaceted. Like, and Orion won this comp, in my opinion, for, uh, she showcased a lot of her skills really, really, really well, but then she really stood out with her like technical expertise. And I, yeah, we represented that in a way and she had her win. So, um, that was cool. Yeah. Really cool to see. Okay, um, so now on to Innsbruck. Uh, women's won. This was a really long comment, so Holy I'm just going to read through certain parts of it. Um, feel free to read through it on your own if you want right. um, later, and then I'll also put the whole photo um, in the video. But yeah, let me just go through some of the um, the points that they made. So the route centers created the worst routes I've ever seen to ruin what could have been so thrilling. Um, jump on W1 literally being a height contest. W2, which was the only technical slab, being the most straightforward, flashable slab that created absolutely no separation in skill. W3 has a jump that's literally impossible for I and Brooke, regardless of if they skipped leg day or not. Um also has a slab on there which probably belongs in a modern art museum because it's served no purpose um w4 again being impossible for i and brooke because of their height imagine asking them to be fully stretched holding on with their fingertips and swing 90 degrees into a fully stretched toe hook while still holding onto your fingertips um etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah a lot of height dependent um comments in this one yeah uh there's so much more i'm like just still reading um yeah go for it. no it's like so i mean i think i'll say this much if someone has th this person has a lot of very strong feelings on the uh on the competition in general so i don't think that even if <laughs> even if i could sit down with them and have a conversation they may or may not change their their uh views um but i will say that there are a few things on here that objectively i i not object I, that I just kind of from a, I just disagree with. Um, number one, jump on number one being a height contest. Um, that situation, if you like look back at the the video or like the replay, you have to jump. Yes, you have to you have to leave the ground <laughs> to achieve the hold. And okay, if you're a little taller. Yes, it is a little easier. That that jump, it couldn't have been a more straightforward, simplistic demand of leg power. Like out of all the things that we ask of the athletes and coordination and jumping and springiness and hot feet and toe catches and all like it is purely like can you can you just and I just doesn't have leg power. And she'd be the first to tell you. She'll be the first to tell you. Did, like, Brooke did it. No problem. Brooke is, yes, a little bit taller than I. 
maybe by what an inch or something. Brooks five two. I don't know what I is. Maybe I's five one. We could probably look and see. But like you watch Brooke and she like does it and she does it and she does it. Um, to me, I actually use that as an example sometimes for folks as like, yeah, we do the best that we can do, but optics go way farther than what our uh, interpretation of the round might be. You and I could have a conversation about this round. The root setters can have a conversation. Hell, anyone can have a conversation. The coaches, and they could all say, everyone could say the same thing that, yeah, that was like a leg power issue there, uh, which I would to my dying day say that's a leg power issue. But Optically, there's millions of other people who are watching this competition and interpreting their own feelings based on what they're seeing. And optically, it looked fucking terrible. It looked real bad. Mm. You have the smallest athlete unable to do this jump move over and over and over and over. And eventually, though, she did it. And why did she do it? She jumped a little bit more. And <clears throat> climbing is not perfect. It's far from fair. Uh, vertical jumps without uh, any shadow of a doubt, are the least fair move, I would say, for a shorter climber. Basically, the taller you are, the easier those moves will be. Um, that being said, though, there are quantifiably uh, more difficult moves for folks who are taller. For example, um, bicycles in an increasingly horizontal roof that are tight. So, like, I mean, I can't really show it here, but, like, I can only get my foot so close to my face and the closer i pull my foot to my face the more i have to engage and the more like my back sags and the more my core has to compensate for that as well as my lower back whereas i don't know how tall you are but if you're under six feet then you're going to be an increasingly a little bit more comfortable position right and and that box gets more comfortable as you get smaller which means that you're actually going to have a greater likelihood of success again all things remaining equal so it's our job to sometimes play off of this whereas like you can't just say okay well eyes in the comp so no jumps just as much as you can't say kai leitner is in the comp so no jumps right because he's just on the opposite end of the spectrum you we just have to find ways to do to do our best again we're, we're humans we're definitely there is no science in terms of like we don't have a, a rubric or something that we can follow to tell us how to do our job. So we have to do our best to, to gauge this level and dictate what's appropriate for, for what it's worth. And maybe it's not much, but we had a couple of folks on the team who actually um, work and have worked with I quite a lot who are on the root setting team. And they made the final calls on whether this height was appropriate. And they were like, we had that thing up probably another eight inches and maybe 20 minutes before the comp we were like is this too high? like me and the chief actually were like is this too high is this too high and then we called over some of these japanese guys and we're like hey is it too high and they're like no no no, it's fine but like if you're really worried about it bring it down and we we're like i think we should bring it down and they're like i mean she's gonna do it she's so good imagine if we left it up <laughs> like eight inches mm. like the world would have burned you know like <laughs> um so we use the, you know, the information to the best of our ability. They weren't trying to hose us. They were trying to give us valid information. They're like, oh, yeah, based on our experiences when we've trained or workshopped with I in the past, she is capable of doing X, Y, or Z. Um, and we have like reference points to, to kind of like go along with that. And this kind of like meets or exceeds our expectations of her on this style of move. So what do we do? You know, we say, all right, well, let's lower it to be safe and move on um other things women's two which is only the quote technical slab i mean it's kind of like i said earlier you really we have four boulders so we need to represent different styles in different in different ways um having 25 percent of the competition be a technical slab to me is good like that's if we have more than that it's a problem if we have less than that it's a problem so I don't know. Maybe their maybe their comment there is about the separation and that too many of the women did it. Maybe we could have made the um, that technical slab a little bit more um, complex or technically demanding. I wouldn't disagree with that. I think that's a fair thing. But um, yeah, uh, let's see what else. Moon four being impossible. Most of this was about height. Yeah, it's, yeah, I'm trying to like, I'm trying to at least like address each point. I don't know if these folks like follow you or or, or listen in because it'd be cool to like at least try to address mm. some of the. I, I guess I won't touch any more of the height thing. I mean, they talked about women's four being impossible for Ira Brooke. I I don't think that's the case. Um, 
maybe it's a bit harder. But then I also find strange ways of getting through things. Like we saw that in the semifinals round as well on that yellow and uh, orange boulder. Um, but I will I will kind of clap back here and say when they said it's it's pretty clear that the root set is completely tunnel visioned on Yanya and created big leaps, leaps and dynamic power moves that would really thought we'd slow her down a little bit. And I'm glad that Yanya flashed every boulder and embarrassed the root setter is really inconsiderate and ignorant mm -hmm. root design to not consider the whole field. We that couldn't be like that could not be farther from the truth. I'll just say that like I usually like to be like pretty I don't know open. Um, that's not the case. Like we do not focus on one single climber. Um, we do not favor climbers. We do not like. It's our job to create the best field of play that we possibly can. And it's not our fault that Yanya is fucking incredible. She is really, 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 really good. And if we were actually trying to do that, like make this this game only for Yanya, then literally I don't know if anyone else would do any zones, much less top boulders. She is that far above and beyond. At least when I saw her last in burn, she is exceptional. So that's just not the case. That's never, I don't ever want anyone to even read a comment on YouTube and think that there's any sort of bias towards any individual athlete or nation or team. Like it's just not, not the thing. And that's why the, the teams are all so diverse. They come from, there's men and women from all different nations. Um, that's why the chiefs switch. It's not just a chief from this country, right? It's, mm. it's constantly, and, the, and typically maybe there's some, uh, some continuity between comps and maybe a team will have a couple of members that were, uh, on let's say Innsbruck this year and maybe next year, but it won't be the whole, like, again, it's in, 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 uh, favor of creating opportunity and new styles and new representation to, make it as open and, and um, not have, have no favoritism, have the least amount of favoritism as possible. So maybe there were some misses again. It's not, it's not, and it's, uh, it's not an easy job. And I would, I wish it sometimes when I see someone like say things like that, I'm like, man, I wish I, I just wish you could come like, you know, climb in our shoes for a day and just to really understand like some mm -hmm. of the decisions that were made because we're truly, like from the bottom of my heart, speaking for the other setters who are on these crews, like truly trying to do our best to create the best field of play and an exciting round and separation and represent diversity of body styles and represent the sponsors. And you know what I mean? Like there's like a lot of things that we're trying to do. And yes, it's if at this level, it's our job to meet or exceed all of those things, but we're not we're not perfect and we do miss things. So it's a bummer that person feels this way, but <sighs> say love you. It'd be interesting if the IFSC could like put out some extra, maybe just like short video that shows a little bit of the behind the scenes during the setting process that they could put out like with the comp um, and just like get some thoughts on like what the setters think they were hoping to accomplish there, any like reservations that they may have had during the setting process. I think maybe that could help clear up a lot of things. I think you're, I think you're right. Um, uh, they were doing a little bit of that last year, um, kind of through Matt. Um, there was a couple of moments, like uh, a lot of times too, like Matt would do it like uh, through other channels as well. Like it wasn't necessarily like an IFSC thing. Um, so depending on where you got your information from, you may or may not have seen some of that information, but yeah, it'd be cool almost if it was like during the feed, you know, like during, during the comp, if there were moments, almost like commercial breaks that were like, Hey, and then here's Ginny with like a 30 seconds behind the scene of what her experience was like setting this world cup, you know, or whatever. Like, yeah, I, th I think you're right. I think if nothing else, both competitively and commercially, the thing that I always find or I have historically found um, is a huge um, factor in people's, I won't just say like happiness, but just like the overall caliber of like, their experience wherever that lands is personifying the experience. That like there aren't little leprechauns and fairies who like wave wands and make these things mm -hmm. happen. Like they're people. It's me. It's yeah. you. It's it's Olga. It's Miley's. It's Remy. It's Pierre. You know, like it's people who are come together to create this thing. And I think that again, that could be the five ten in your in your home gym. That could be the the V four at your home gym. And 
if you kind of put some eyes to that person and those the group of people, what they're trying to do and understand a little bit about where they're coming from and their intentionality behind it, I think that usually goes quite a long way in understanding and having a little bit more empathy um, towards the situation. And, and if nothing else, athletic empathy towards the, the event or or the uh, the climb itself. So, Yeah, that's precisely why I wanted to do that. <laughs> 10 points to you. <laughs> Okay. Um, Burn Men's One, uh, that photo. This was one of the positive comments that I took. Best comp of the season on both sides in terms of setting and competition. Thanks. Well, thank you. And then Burn Women's, again, just like the first photo I'd taken, the only one I had taken. Um, this one I just wanted to talk a bit about since people are always asking for this. Um, I would love to see Yanya take on the men's course, uh, really realizing that not every woman would be able to or want to take on a men's course. I think she would love to test herself. Um, she has the drive to push the women's competition further and show just how strong women are. She's in a class by herself. Go, Yanya. Um, so I think with this one, I just kind of wanted to ask how you think she would fare on a men's route. Because... Um, as a viewer, it I like can't quite pinpoint why, but the boulders do look very different. And so, yeah, I wonder how you think she would perform on them. I think she would do well, to be completely honest. I think she would do really well. Exactly what really well looks like, I don't know. Um, I think if she had a good day, there's like no reason... I'm trying to think back critically here before I go put my foot in my mouth on a podcast. And in terms of like reach and stuff as well. Well, we would just, ca I mean, she's not like shorter than uh Serato, you know what I mean? So like that would be a non-issue there. Um, there are shorter, like Nimrod Marcus is like not the tallest climber either. Um, and like Mechi is the tallest. So yeah, I mean, she would fall within the range of kind of average athlete size. Um, I think she would do well. I, I'm not going to put predictions on on what what she would do when and where, but I think she like definitely. I feel like stands a chance. I maybe mean, maybe more than stands a chance. I think she could do. I think she could do well. Um, but yeah, I don't know what that would look like. I don't know how that could work. I don't know if that's ever her desire. Um, I did. I was hanging out with one of her like teammates in uh countryman gregor uh Vizonic, a couple maybe a couple months ago and he was kind of saying i was like oh yeah how's she doing because like i won't say yanya and i are like friends but like we chat every now and again see how you're doing check in if we're at a comp hang out whatever go get a drink catch up but i was asking i was asking hey, how you how you how's she doing how you doing how's the team doing you know whatever like you guys getting ready for the upcoming season you know whatever just standard and he's like dude Yanya is in like unreal form. Like normally she apparently they have like this spray wall that they'll like do like trainer boulders on and stuff like that. And normally she's like kind of right there. One and one, two with men, the men's field, like she'll do the boulder. They'll do the boulder. They'll do the boulder. She'll do the boulder in no particular order. It's there. And he said this year, she's just like, like they won't touch the boulders and she does the boulders. And this isn't like random civilians like this is their team you know what i mean so i think that she yeah she would smash so i'll see her in two weeks or three weeks uh so we'll see but um yeah she'd smash really cool here yeah awesome um okay and then one thing one last thing about innsbruck i think you had mentioned that you guys had reset a whole boulder after it was signed off what happened there uh great question so basically the way that the competition work week typically flows is that the beginning of the week is like finals boulders go up and then like midweek is semis and then end of the week is qualies and the reason for that is like qualies are then left up on the wall and roll right into the next the first day of qualifying for the competition right um and then also like finals happen first because you have the most amount of resources to pull from and, you know, just kind of all the things. So 
<clears throat> the way that we broke it out, we broke it down is the infrac wall is pretty big and it had enough space to put up all the finals boulders at once. And so what we did was we kind of went like, all right, men's bay, women's bay, men's bay, women's bay, men's bay, women's bay, all the way down. So we didn't pick like this is men's one or this is women's three. We just kind of said like, okay, this is the women's team. This is the men's team. Here's your bays. We'll talk about style. We'll talk about hold selection, the hold selection of style or the hold selections in general. That was a whole other conversation. We had to be like, uh, very particular about which holds went on the wall at, during certain rounds um, per the event organizer sponsorship agreements. Um, so that was a limiting factor at a number of occasions. Um, so it got to the point where we set this boulder and it was actually a boulder that I kind of was pioneering. Um, and the concept for me was that like, if you were facing the Innsbruck wall, whatever you, you saw the Innsbruck wall, you're climbing, you're a rock climber. But if you turned around the the audience and the wall and the mountains were just like bananas it was so beautiful and like i was like i think we need to set some sort of like face out experience here both for that for the athletes and for the spectators like the athletes get to look at the the spectators and the wall and the you know it's like take this in and then um the spectators get to see the emotion of the climber as they're trying really hard um, in a world cup final. So that was the concept. Uh, long story short, the concept got on the wall and I won't say it failed, but it definitely did not meet my personal standard of what I would have liked to have seen be on the wall for any round really it just there were too many question marks remaining there were a number of like possibilities for cheating uh, this was for a men's men's boulder which it ended up being men's one so if anyone remembers that boulder and I'll, I'll talk more about that but it just like it, the, the 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 bay the zone was wrong and the, the holds that kind of were like picked out i just I just didn't do a great job to be completely frank and we worked on it we spent a lot of time as a team the team invested a lot into this boulder and it just like didn't do it, you know? So we ticked it, we picked it, the online observation came and the whole time I'm like, damn it, like not your best Cody, you know? And it kind of sat with me for a little bit and was, it wasn't like weighing on my week. Like I was like, okay, it's done. Now it's, now it's semis day or now it's whatever day. But after a little while I looked at the team and we had a really, really good team. Um, and we always have a good team, but this, this team was like really gelling and like getting stuff done we weren't limited by time. We had no time constraints or anything like that. So I went up to the chief, um, you know, at dinner one night or maybe it was at lunch, something like that. And I was like, Hey, what do you think about like, if we reset this and he's like, no, 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 no. And I was like, just think about it. Like, you know, we have opportunity here. We have an opportunity here to like make something really special. And I don't know if we did it. Like, remember we have this potential beta break. We have this potential beta break. Like it's too easy here. It's too hard here. And he's like, yeah, you're right. Like, let's think about it. And I was like, look, just think about it and I'll take it on if need be, if we have time or whatever, like, and he's like, yeah, but then you have to deal with online observation. I was like, look, if we have the time and space, I'll just like, give, you just tell me, Cody, you have two hours or you have three hours and like whatever that is. And I'll make it, I'll make it happen. And if it doesn't happen, then we already know we have a boulder that's like in our pocket. You know what I mean? Like this boulder, the show will still go on. Um, so I ended up getting the opportunity, reset this boulder, then brought the team over. We, I was at that point able to move the boulder over a bay, over a lane. So it was a much more compelling uh, lane for the movement that we were chasing, which was that pressing and, and, and all that. And uh, it, it like, it was like butter. It just went, it just flowed because it was like the right area with the right tools for the job. And it was kind of a testament to like, sometimes, you know, trying to put a square peg in a round hole, just like, ain't it, you know, you just like, you can, you can have all the time in the world and, and the best, the best workers working on the thing. But if it's just not fitting, maybe it's just not fitting. So we got lucky. Uh, and maybe we set up ourselves with luck by, being able to work. We worked pretty hard prior. The team came together. We had a really nice session on this, on this climb, got it to where it wanted to be. And honestly, I was like super, super happy with it by the end of like when the competition was going on, it, it met exactly our uh, quota for what we wanted to see in terms of performance on the athletes. And it was like a 
super exciting start to the show. And that's what we wanted. We wanted to like get the show off with a bang. It's the last World Cup men's finals of the season, get the crowd in it, get the athletes in it, be like a fun, um, pressy, funky thing, huge jump, lots of tops. Um, and yeah, so it was cool. It was really, really cool. I was like very, very happy to have that experience. And did you still manage to have that face out moment? Yeah, actually it was like way more pure uh, in this way because the panel that was initially allocated was maybe it was only like 20 degrees or 25 degrees overhanging. And so we were having to like build out with a lot of volumes and larger holds. But the problem is, is that the wall was completely flat. And so we had to use vol like these volumes, but kind of like I was mentioning earlier, we were fixed as to which brands we were allowed to use in certain rounds based on like sponsorship agreements. And so due to the, the selection of other boulders that happened prior to this boulder, I was left kind of with a, a certain pool of holds and certain brands to pick from. And it just didn't quite fit the needs of that profile. But then when we switched profiles, it turned into this more much steeper cave with like a kind of dihedral ish situation. Then those holds actually worked perfectly for what we were trying to create because they were lower profile. They were, they did have a lot of surface area, but it, they just, it, it wasn't the right tool for the job in the previous version. And it was exactly the right tool for the job um, when we, when we move things around. So, yeah. Wow. Yeah. I feel like it's really cool hearing the, concept behind the boulders it makes me feel like i should go back and rewatch them now knowing this mm. and then seeing how it i guess translates over the video screen and like seeing how the climbers climb it so yeah that's really interesting to hear behind the scenes yeah please excuse this brief intermission but i would just like to remind you that if you are enjoying this podcast please follow and rate it on your preferred listening platform if you're watching on youtube i would love to hear your discussion and thoughts in the comments below anything helps to push this podcast out to more people and get even more amazing guests on back to the show one last question about IFSC related setting. Um, I think this was also one of the Discord questions that someone had asked. Um, where do you see IFSC setting, top level comp setting evolving to? I think what will happen, I think the most likely course of action, again, broad strokes on the whole, is that the setting will be continued will be more dictated by the parameters of the given event. For example, when we have Olympic qualifying events this year, or we have, let's say, the Olympics themselves, there's multi-zone scoring, right? So we saw this at a few different comps so far, um, like if it was like continental events, um, we've seen this. So you, you're going to have like a low zone effectively, a zone and a top. And I, I don't remember exactly, but you get like a minimum amount of points for the first zone. I think it was like five, 10, 25, maybe if that's what it is, I, I'd be lying to you. I don't remember off the top of my head, but what, what end up, you end up seeing is like, you kind of need moments in between the zones. At least that a lot of times that's what it's interpreted as. Like wh why do you get a zone? Why? because you've done something to demarcate success. Someone is thinking that that is successful. So I think at least for this season, you might notice maybe a little more choppiness, um, especially when we're trying to represent all the styles still. You might be able to represent a few more styles or at least like, you know, a little bit of, of extra in between because now we kind of have like this extra zone to play with but numerically it does create some problems where like the difference between start and and zone a low zone is five points okay so it's five points the next is again five more points it's five to ten but then that zone to top is a 15 point differential right now you're because you get 25 so you have to showcase some sort of exceptional moment i would say to, to demarcate the difference in athlete uh, performance from zone to top. So I think you might end up seeing maybe more similar styles to what we saw in burn, both in the 
world championship and the combined just more action up high and more success down low which i think does actually answer some of the folks kind of questions or or uh feedback from what we read on like the youtube videos of like it's not that fun to watch people just like try and fail like right off the ground and that's true um so you're gonna see more of like building moments i think as people learn moves but i think you'll also see more learned moves so i don't i don't think we're gonna get away from uh more coordination style um i think we might see more lower body coordination more things having to do with like hips and core and legs and feet um because they require a just a different ask of the athlete a lot of times if we have coordination up high right hand cordo uh it's limited or determined success or failures a lot of times I mean, it's determined by a lot of things but if i can pull more or hold longer i'm more likely to succeed right a lot of times again like broad strokes but it, but if it's more lower body and core and feet and stuff then there's more learning involved and maybe more leg power involved and more you know what i mean there's just like so you might see more of that um but i would say you, you might see more of the stuff like we saw in um you know that like high flying fun boulder and hachi Oji. like you're gonna need it like if it's a coordination boulder you're gonna need to showcase coordination in some numerical differential from zone to top so what's that going to look like i mean I, I can guess as well as you but that'd be my my guess it'd suck if that like to use our example earlier where if Ginny's like the cordo master you know and i'm some and i'm just a power climber you know i'm just good at pulling on holds that the thing that's going to like the boulder that's for your comp for cordo and you're like you turn around like yes it's cordo boulder and that's you only get to do that from zero to five or from five to 10, right? But it's an easy enough version that I'm also able to play and fight on it. So then I also get can get those points and, and showcase my skills, even though my even though my skills are much less than you in this represented style. But then the top of the Cordo Boulder is just like grabbing on a four mil edge and just yarding to another four mil edge, right? But that's the Cordo Boulder. Do you, do you know what I mean? Like then, then it's like, well, we don't, we didn't represent the coordination style climber. We represented the power climber, really, at the end of it. Um, so I guess in summary, there will probably be lots of changes, and it will be dictated by the, the field, um, the rules. The field of play will be dictated, I think, a lot by the rules and the scoring. And we're, if nothing else, I know no matter who's on the teams, they're going to be you know, firing on all cylinders to create the best comp. So... Um, if nothing else, know that. And what does like lower body coordination look like to you? Do you have like an example of that? Um, so it's not, this isn't the most pure version, but if we looked back on women's one prog finals, it was a green and black boulder. It was like green rock city fiberglass with black volumes. And it was this lache or lombada or swing set or whatever you want to call it you like jump to these two holds and you like did this swing and then you time it right and then as you're swinging you match this hold and oh, generate this. off this you hate them or you love them oh i love them oh you love them okay awesome. yeah. <laughs> and then but like so you need upper body like the, okay so someone who's listening is like well cody that's all upper body there's no upper body left or no lower body but that's just like to get the generation started that's like that's integral to the move yes but it's not like there's so much more to come. So then you like do this thing and then you have to time your hips with the trajectory of your body into the wall, right? And where do you release that point, right? Based on how you're releasing this hold, how you timed this, right? And then where do you land on this volume? Do you do you cheat inside? Do you cheat outside? Do you cheat forward or back? Where's your ankle landing? How flat's your foot? And then we're not even there yet, right? That's just like the interaction point. That's like, then you still have the whole reception of what happens after. What are you doing with your hand, right? What are you doing with your with your foot? Are you stutter stepping? Are you toe catching, right? Like you're just adding in these levels of complexity that are asking questions in time and space to the climber that they have to, they can only get the opportunity to learn or answer as it's occurring. You can't like, just be like, I'll pull harder and I'll do the move. You have to be like, I need to be better to do the move. And so what is being better? Okay, let me critically evaluate what I just did here. And I failed because, and then work backwards, right? And then maybe to move forwards, then I must 
fill in the blank. So maybe it may be full body rather than just lower body, but um, those two things I think you'll see, you'll probably see some more of. Yeah. I mean, we've definitely already started seeing a ton of those and I love like lache moves as well. I'm still personally trying to figure them out. I just can't get it working. I don't know why, but there's a lot of steps to it. So maybe that's why. It's a lot of learning. But then I'll say that like once you figure out functionally why it works for you, even like if you just figure out the 101 or 102 version or where, wherever you're at in your experience, it doesn't matter which, you figure out kind of the meat and potatoes of what makes that work. And you then have the building blocks for all the moves afterwards. And that's why they're, I think a, a lot, they're really popular right now is that like you can just like get better at them. You can learn how to get better at them. You don't have to go to the the hang board or like the tension board or the moon board and like Arr! that's still valued. Like you still should do that. Like to become a well-rounded climber, you need to have that like grit, right? But then there's also this fun aspect of it of like, oh, I'm learning something new about my body and myself and my how I'm interacting on the wall. That's like very, very appealing to I think an increasingly large percentage of the population. And it just so happens to also be awesome for competition separation on really low intensity level moves, um, which is also quite nice. Yeah. There's something very satisfying about that point where you're working on it and then you kind of unlock it for yourself where you finally understand how your body moves in that way. And then it gets like all of those get a bit easier. And then you just add on the other layers of like little tweaks that make it a bit more, a bit more weird or yeah, climbers like checking boxes, right? And like, if you can figure out, okay, I know how to start this style of move now. And then, okay, now I know how to add in a different style of this other move. And then you can start almost like Lego blocking them together to create these chains of things. You know, um, you can start checking these boxes. And okay, I've unlocked that skill now. And now I can approach a, another skill that I can add into this, right? Now I can check another box of my skills and just keep developing all at the same time. You're still becoming a better, stronger climber. You know, your fingers are getting stronger, your biceps are getting stronger, your back's getting stronger, legs. Making me excited to unlock that one. Heck yeah. Well, you can come visit. Uh, we're opening up a climbing gym up here um, just south of Boston. So we're going to, we'll have all kinds of styles of climbing. Don't get me wrong, but we'll have a lot of resources uh, available to us to create those special style of moves as well. Oh yeah. I'll visit for sure. I'll let you know. <laughs> um, and yeah, we'll talk about that as well, but yeah, let's get back into like the general route setting kind of stuff. Um, so how hard do you climb versus the climbers that you're setting for? And do you ever kind of feel intimidated setting for these like elite um, worldwide level climbers? Those are two really, really good questions. And Maybe I'll flip flip them and answering them. Um, sure. I'll say that like I think now that I've had a number of opportunities to work alongside these athletes, um, both in competition setting or workshop setting or you know whatever it is, you realize like they're. I know it's like the funny thing. It's like they're just people too, and it's like they are. You know what I mean? They just like happen to you know, for whatever reason to fall into this, this life. And, um, they're really, really good climbers and they're exceptional people and their methodologies and their trainings and all that stuff. And I remember the first, like, I remember when I went to, to Poland that first time to set for this international event, I was like, uh, worried, you know, I was like, am I good enough? Is this imposter syndrome situation happening? Am I supposed to be here? Is like, and this is for a kid's comp, you know what I mean? These are just like, I mean, granted it was 26 nations, you know, it's 26 countries are all coming to Poland to climb on shit that I'm being a part of help create. So you feel the pressure, the coaches, the parents, the, the athletes. Um, but then you check that box and you're like, okay, like I, I did it. Like, okay. Like I, maybe I am, supposed to be here things could have been better i can i can self-analyze and self-assess and be like i could have done this better and i should have done that better but also give yourself some grace like you did this okay you did this okay uh, and then i think that just like develops you know so then you know i um foran for my first world cup and there was a lot of nervousness in a way because 
root setters have this conversation a lot. And I don't care if you've this is your first QE that you're ever setting or literally world championships. You're you were always worried year over year over year. Like, is this it? Is this my last chance? Like, I have to show my best because if I don't, what happens if I just don't get selected again? Is it is it because of something that I could do right now or or don't do right now? So I remember feeling quite a bit of pressure for that, but I tried to just like, okay, no, I'm good. I've been training. I feel in good shape. I I'm going to do my best to I'm going to try my best to be the best person of what they want to see. Right? What do they what do they need from me? I'm going to offer that to them. I'm not going to do more. Um, unless they would like to see it because I don't want to be overbearing or anything like that um, and just be the best asset to the team and to create the best competition that I can. That's what I always I always go back to. So it's about the competition because um, I want to be a part of it. And that's the part that could feel intimidating sometimes, but less so the athletes. Like it, it's almost, the, it's like the environment beforehand. And it's like the athletes, they're, they're coming whether we like it or not. You know what I mean? Like Saturday morning comes or Friday morning comes, whatever the comp is, like those athletes are coming. Um, it can though sometimes like, you know, you'd be like, oh shit, like that's Adam Andra. Like he is, he's climbed some stuff, you know, or like, oh, there's a, uh, you know, Brooke Rabbit too. And I've been, I've been setting for her for a very, very long time, all the way like through her youth circuit. But then you see her now and you're like, you know, wow. Or Natalia, that's, that's our Olympian, you know? So sometimes, you know, you kind of step back and you're like, oh, wow, that, that can be a little bit, uh, you know, if nothing else, you're like, this is important. I need to take my job seriously here. Like, I think that's, um, that's that. But as far as climbing level, uh, Jenny, that's like a trillion, trillion dollar question. And like, like outdoor grades and indoor grades and whether you climb in the South versus the North versus the West coast versus Colombia versus, you know, Iran, like sure. There's like relative levels. Um, there's stylistic preferences based on area development for sure. Like if there's any truism in climbing, I would say that's one of them. Um, but as far as competition, root setting and climbing the one thing that i'll uh, i won't i can't really answer your question so so well because we don't even use v grades in comp setting yeah. like at all we don't we talk about levels we talk about athlete success or failure given uh certain uh parameters but one thing i'll, I'll never forget so i was working with josh a lot uh josh larson he's like like i was mentioning like our national team coach olympic team coach and he's been a friend of mine for like years just due to the nature that we like kind of lived close and we ended up sitting at the same gym and he was a head setter and like whatever. Um, and I remember like years and years and years and years ago, he was, he's such a good climber. He's such a good outdoor climber, indoor climber, just like he's fucking amazing. There's no other, no other way to go around. He's only gotten better over the years. I don't understand it. Uh, it's just, it's mm-hmm. impressive. And I remember we went, we went up to Montreal for a comp one time, me, him, his brother, and this woman, Isabel Faust, who's like the most low key crusher in American rock climbing. If you don't know who she is, look her up. She's like bananas. Like she's climbed more V14, V15. I think she's climbed V15. She's like, she's so good. We went up and like, I wanted to make finals and I didn't make finals and I was bummed out and Josh made finals. And I was like, dude, how do you do it? Like, how do you balance, you know, like commercial route setting, competition route setting and outdoor climb? Because he also climbed outdoors way stronger than me. And I was like, I want to reach whatever this level or this level. And I was like struggling. And he's like, dude, like at some point you got to pick one. You know, like no matter what, you're going to get better. And, and if you get better at one, the other one will trail and you will also, it will elevate. Mm-hmm. But like, you got to pick one. And I was like, I don't want to pick one. And he's like, he's like the best, yeah. best athletes do. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times, like you look at traditional sports, the best pitchers aren't batting cleanup and hitting grand slams. Right. You look at, mm-hmm. you know, hockey, the best scorers aren't always the best defensemen. You know, there's like, uh, maybe these aren't the best examples of, of, uh, comparison, but like, sometimes you have to like pick a lane and try to focus on it and get really, really more, ex- more experience, um, or yeah. as experience as you can. And so for me, I, for what this is worth, this is a super fucking long wind, winded way to say that, like, I've noticed personally that as I reduced my amount of day-to-day commercial route setting, 
and involvement in traditional climbing gyms and upped my competition environment. I won't even just say like comps, but like if I, if I teach 12 to 15 clinics a year about competition route setting, I'm in a competition environment. If I'm going on phone calls with people about like, how do we up our youth team engagement? I'm in a competition environment. If I go to a world cup, okay, I'm in a competition environment. All of a sudden now my brain is like almost rewiring to only think about like comp style. And so my competition style due to all these reasons is just like elevating. So in some way, in some instances I can perform quite well on competition style boulders, regardless of the level. And in other instances, like it's not even, it's not even funny. Like I'll just get like, I can't touch them, you know? Uh, and hmm. I think it's just a matter of like knowing where you best fit as a member of a team. And sometimes, uh, I mean, I, th I think if nothing else, you just like keep pushing and keep trying to get better. But I, it's really hard for me to tell you like where where do I stand to like a whatever like a Zach Gala or I don't know like Zach Gala is a way 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 infinitely better climber than I am. You know what I mean? Like there's no competition there. Um, but that's not his job, and that's not my job. My job is not a professional athlete. His job is not a professional root setter. The demand of each is different and rigorous and trying and in its own ways and neither of them are right or wrong they're just different you know and um like if he wanted I, I will say this if he wanted to be a professional root setter you know granted he gained i don't i don't know him like i know him well enough i don't know all of his ins and outs but like granted he achieves the soft skills necessary uh he has the hard skills and the technical ability and the climbing ability to achieve whatever he would want in the com competition root setting world, I, I would not have the same opportunity. Like I, there's, I, there's no way I could, you could give me all the days and the weeks in the world. And he is just a much more gifted athlete than I am, than I'll ever be. So you don't think you could like make a U.S. national team? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, those athletes, I no. maybe like, I mean, there's certain, there's certain styles maybe that I would, that I have a preference or an affinity towards that I have found that over the years that I'm more predisposed to. And like, maybe I can do quicker than someone else or have like, I might be like, Oh, that didn't, you know, in my brain, I might think like, Oh, that didn't feel so bad for me. And then I watch other athletes perform or other roots that are performing. They might be struggling a little bit more and I'll be like, huh, interesting. So maybe, yeah, there's situations like that. But if it came like down to brass tacks, like, no, like I don't think so at all. <laughs> I have competed though. I mean, I've competed, I competed at Vail uh, a couple of years ago um didn't do so great you know like i just like I, I did it more for like learning you know like what is it like to be on the other side of the curtain because i think that helps helped me be a little bit more well-rounded yeah a bit of a detour but you're setting for veil this year right i am yeah yeah i am um super excited i'll be in june probably try to get there a little bit early the altitude is wild or that not the altitude elevation is wild um it can oh make, crap! Okay, can make performance difficult at that at that level. Oh no, that's not good. But that's good to know. <laughs> Why is that? Are you going to go compete? I was convinced to sign up to compete um, by a previous podcast guest, um, Albert Oak, and um, it's coming up, and I'm mm -hmm. not ready. <laughs> so. Uh, just gonna hope to i don't think trying to not get last is a good goal because then i'm like my goal is dependent on how other people are doing so maybe i'll just like try to get a zone or something yeah that's an awesome way to look at it i think that's very uh astute like don't compare your performance on others but like that's what i did i was like i just want to get like a zone that was my goal and I got a couple zones, got a few zones. I dropped a couple tops and I was like, damn, hell yeah, this is great. Um, and I had a fun time and just, I went into it with like more fun. Like, let's just enjoy. And if, I think if I could unsolicitedly offer anything, would just be like, if you go into it with like a fun aspect, don't be like, oh my God, it's coming. I have to blah, 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 blah. Like nobody cares. There was like this article years ago that was like, nobody cares that you rock climb. It's all only, you only care that you rock climb, but you think that other people care that you rock climb. You know what I mean? And it was meant to be like a conversation to yourself of like, it's only about you. 
like really your performance is about you and you should be like it's like be kind to yourself be kind to others kind of thing but like just worry about yourself and like if you're having fun then that's all that matters you know and uh but i will give you this bit of advice get there early because that elevation is fucking bananas like you will be sucking wind more than you care to know literally so yeah a couple days flying a couple days early go on a couple hikes go up to even higher do that once or twice a day eat a bunch of extra food bunch of extra water don't drink too much alcohol that will help you a lot oh gosh okay i don't know why Vale was suggested i should have chosen a different one i like there's only only salt lake is the other one yeah i should have done that Vale's cool though. Vale's like, you're gonna get there. If you, have you been there? No. You're you're gonna get there, and you're gonna be like, okay, this is why I chose this one because the vent, like the environment, the venue, the spectacle, the like feel of it is just like, it's very, uh, it's pretty powerful. Like, this is this is climbing to me when you just like see all these people come together there's mountains behind you there's people who don't know really about climbing at all who are there like supporting climbers like the the amount of spectators is for sure bigger than any other event that we have like it it, i don't mean that to (laughs) scare you but it's like there's a lot of people there who are like fucking psyched that there's climbing going on And, and to me that gets me psyched Oh, that'll be cool to see. I mean, yeah, I'm mostly just signing up to get the experience, see what it's about. Um, I yeah, I don't even know how it goes. Like, I don't think I don't. Do people watch qualifiers? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because it's like an open air and venue. So like anyone who's in like that Vale Village, they'll just like walk up, you know, and hang out. And it's also like a whole weekend. So it it's like the GoPro games. So they have like a youth component. And they have a citizens component. It's like there are a lot of people who just come to experience climbing in the mountains, you know, and um, come hang out in Vail even because it's just like a cool place. I mean, yeah, there'll be people there watching qualifiers. And if nothing else, too, there's like um, depending on number of participants, we'll have like multiple waves. So like let's say you're in wave two, like all the wave one folks are going to watch wave two and see how they perform and you know what i mean (laughs) no matter what that's gonna happen though that's gonna happen in salt lake that's gonna happen you know in Vail. so that just happens i'm starting to regret this decision a bit Uh, (laughs) you're gonna do just fine yeah we'll see how that goes maybe i'll i'll message you you can let me know what the boulders are i can prepare yeah uh you know this has been awesome but i definitely (laughs) respectfully won't do that (laughs) but i'll tell you how much fun that you're gonna have and that you should definitely come yeah okay maybe see you there okay Uh, but yeah to distract myself from thinking about that anymore (laughs) let's get back into the route setting um how long are your days for route setting comparatively between setting for IFSC versus maybe like a national comp versus a local competition? I'd say that like if it's a upper level like national comp, you know, like let's say an NACS or um, I mean honestly any honestly any of the national comps they're all they all have uh, a different amount of there's different things about them that make them have more effort here versus more effort there. And the example might be like, look at youth boulders, like the level of boulder problem on any individual youth climb is like vastly lower than let's say your elite level nationals, like your open nationals. And then even more so comparatively to like an, you know, a world cup. Right. But you have like a trillion boulders to set, you know? So it's like this, there's just so many rounds of climbing. So, you know, but then you look at, you know, World Cup boulder, you might say, okay, I have very few boulders to set, relatively speaking, but the level and attention to detail and the viewership, right? The optics, like we talked about earlier, there's just so much going on that you have to spend this time to make sure that it is as right or as close to right as you think is as possible. Um, so nationals and like a world cup, you know, they're 
pretty similar in terms of time investment, I'd say. Um, the days look differently. What you're doing with your body and your time on those days might be a little bit different. Um, definitely, you, you have to have, and depending on the level of competition, like let's say I said, um, okay, we'll have Vail Citizens, right? Which is like a red point round in Vail versus an NACS versus a Youth Boulders Nationals versus an Adult Boulder Nationals and a World Cup. Like you have this kind of like gradient almost of maybe they all roughly have a similar time or something like that, like of investment that you have to set. But what is asked of you as a root setter in terms of uh, creativity and then as well as like physical demand in terms of performance on Boulder problems to be like the most valuable member possible on the team increases. You know what I mean? So you just have to have the experience to back that a lot of times. That doesn't mean that you have to, oh, everyone on the team has to climb AB if you're hitting a World Cup. That's not the case. But you have to, if you're not that person, you have to have then other skill sets to help offset maybe that differential in some way or at least add to it. Maybe not offset, but like add to it. Um, that's definitely not to say that the strongest root setters in terms of physical capability are the best root setters. And there's many, many instances where that's actually not the case and that sometimes that can be a hindrance. So a lot of people think like, oh, it's just these boulder bros who just like grunt and take their shirts off and bro down. Like, no, maybe in the past, I don't know. Maybe in the past, that was a thing. I personally do not enjoy that on my teams, um, whether I'm the chief or I'm an assistant or whatever. Um, definitely something that is more like low key and communal and like together goes quite a long way for me but we do have a job to do and you do have to be able to sometimes sometimes you just someone has to do the move sometimes someone has to do the sequence and you know support that person in that moment or support that team in that moment that's that's what's critical and it's nice it feels really 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 nice if you can be that person sometimes you know if you're like oh the team the team needs me right now like all right like i can i can do this you know and it that's those are my favorite like personally my favorite favorite moments like if there's you know it's 3 a.m this thing isn't going you feel like you're spinning wheels and you're like okay the team the team needs something right now we're gonna put on some some good music you know like drink a coffee and we're gonna like start firing things here and uh that's i love that that's that's great so that balance is is key what makes a route setting team work for you so we talk about this a lot in um different like workshop and clinics that I do. It's like what makes a great root setter or better even to go further, like what makes a great root setter that you know, like someone that you know, what, what makes them, what sets them apart. So maybe this is a similar question. Um, so from like an individual level, um, someone who's a good communicator, someone who's able to like both give and receive feedback well and in different ways, at different times, someone who's able to manage stress well, someone who's able to manage themselves and their own personal life well. I know that sounds silly, but like, are you someone that like needs to like have their hand held to like go get food, go get coffee, go get water, go like whatever? Or are you someone who's like a self starter and can like knows when they need to turn it on and turn it back and like manage their own performance throughout the week? Um, do you have a good attitude? Are you fun to be around? Do I like to, do I want to spend the next nine days with you? You know, cause I, I, I make this joke sometimes. It's like a lot of times, you know, we'll be in hotel rooms together or like, you know, rooms that have bunk beds or something like that. And it's like, if you and I are on a team, do I want to be with dealing with Ginny every day and i mean that in every sense of the word like respectfully like i wake up and i open my eyes and there she is across the room staring at me and then i go downstairs and she's brushing her teeth and then like she's making coffee and then we go to the wall and then we're conversing during the day and then we eat lunch and it just goes and then you and then you go to bed good night and you close your eyes right and it's like the first thing i see last thing i see like you want this person to be somebody that you like care to be around you know and even if and if things get tough what is their response to the things that are tough? How do they, how do they deal with that? And that can be a quite an important thing as a team member as well. Like what's your penchant for dealing with adversity um, in, in difficult times? So 
those are just i mean then there's all the hard skills you know climbing ability level mastery of movement you know are they able to to use their resources creatively do they know the field do they know how to calibrate if if this then this right what do those skill sets look like on the fly or do they need to be told you know what i mean like there's a, quite a lot of things but those are some of them oh yeah it's like a whole relationship yeah i know literally yeah it's like such a relationship <laughs> with Jeez. with eight other people you know or seven other people you know yeah um but having yeah, a diverse okay. team too like i definitely do not love when it doesn't happen so often anymore but like when all the the climbers look the same feel the same climb the same that's not great mm-hmm. uh jack of all trades master and none is i think increasingly a thing of the past uh, for a high performance root setting, I think naturally you have to have an exceptional level of all these things that I mentioned, including climbing styles and whatever. But mm-hmm. if you have a few things that you're like exceptional at that really set you apart, that are like the ace up your sleeve, that's fucking awesome. Because like if I'm like, oh yeah, Ginny, like I really need this like men's quarter boulder to be like really hard like really only want like to see three zones and like one to two tops and you're like got it i know exactly what you're looking for i've done this a million times and that's not to say that you're like Mm -hmm. the end all be all but like your knowledge of what that level looks like and how that's gonna uh present itself on the wall and ultimately yeah okay there's different ways we can do it but you have a good feeling and then you can get that Mm -hmm. that feeling really close so that way the team or the small group can come together and the team can come together and, and make adjustments or adaptions um, as needed and have the conversation. And ultimately, you know, we make we make the calls as the team, but you can get us there a lot closer as opposed to like if you were or I was like, I don't know, I'm not really good at Cordo or I'm not I'm not really great at that style or I'm not, you know, like I don't really know what that looks like. Then your first draft or second draft might actually be quite far off. Right. And then there's more effort that needs to be put in. So you just multiply that out over the work week. And before you know it, you're like, ah, it's pretty sweet to have different people who are good at different things and different sizes and different, you know, knowledge bases all coming together. What's your expertise? My expertise. Um, I don't know. I like to be fun to be around. (laughs) I like to like make people be happy and have a good comp week and, uh, motivate people and, um, those things are quite important to me. I'd say if it was like a climbing style, um, I try really hard to work on my weaknesses. My weaknesses are like, I'm really not great at like uh, small holds overhanging, for example. I'm a bigger guy. Um, probably probably the heaviest international, uh, like person who sets internationally for competitions um, by quite a bit. Uh, like 200 pounds if I'm feeling fit as a fiddle. Usually sit around like 215, 220, 225, <laughs> sometimes more. Um, but then with that, right, that's not just all negative. Um, you know, I typically retain muscle a little bit differently than your average climber. So things that are more pushing oriented, um, those like jump press moves, you know, even on d- more difficult versions. I, I actually, for me personally, they feel like once they're finalized, I'm like, ah, oh, okay, I, that doesn't feel so bad. Like you're talking like upper body triceps and biceps, and I'm like, oh, I have that. Like that's cool, you know. Maybe, but if I'm grabbing small edges in a roof and doing all kinds of crazy moves, like that's much harder for me. Um, lower body cordo, upper body, uh, lower body, and like you know, I was like kind of discussing earlier, like those those I found um, higher success with, and then even like certain types of uh, slab as well. Maybe not the most technical and precise on like very small edges. Again, I have like a bigger chest, so a lot of times that like pushes me back a little bit, and the center of gravity isn't as as an as uh, ideal for my pinnacle of performance as i would love it but if it's like i have really weirdly like flexible ankles probably from like playing hockey and that lower body lower leg uh power is is pretty good so i think like in those types of situations where i can accentuate that um 
and then maybe like strong lower back and stuff again like for pushing and pressing and um and compressing too i mean that's fine but um if i were to pick a few things that maybe those would be more standouty so that's kind of what you bring to your setting as well um it depends. Like if it's like a local comp or a regional or divisional, something like that, like then relatively speaking, everything for me, I, I feel comfortable. I feel comfortable at providing any, any, whatever the team needs. I'm, and I'm comfortable providing that to, in any situation. I, I feel like I have this, the experience now and the knowledge to like draw from actual moments in time and be like, and apply them to the setting. Um, so for yeah, especially for the lower levels, lower level events, like yeah, okay, whatever, whatever you need. But then if it's like if someone's like, all right, Cody, we need you to set like the hardest thing, and we really need it to be like unique and special and funky or whatever. What do you got for me mm-hmm. that you only you only got an hour? You know, like there's like some time com- mm-hmm. constraint or something like that. I'm gonna anybody I think would naturally default to the thing that you feel the most comfortable with because you're like okay there's constraints here Mm -hmm. there's eyes on me i have to achieve this goal um i'm probably going to default to one of those things that i previously mentioned um unless explicitly asked otherwise in which case hey all right like i'm up for a challenge let's go (laughs) and then one last question about rod setting in general um i think i feel this way i think a few other people have um felt this as well um, I feel like when I watch USA like national comps, the setting feels and looks pretty different from what I see on like an international circuit. Um, and I just, I don't really know why. Um, is this something that you feel like is the case or are we just like, are we just seeing things? I don't think that you're just seeing things. Cause if you're feel like your feelings are valid, right? You're picking up on something what that is to you i don't i don't know but i would i mean maybe i'd ask some questions as to like do you think that it's it's probably pattern driven but what type of pattern i don't know like is it movement patterns that maybe you feel that are different is it like hold shapes as patterns is it like the placement of holds or volumes it could be stylistically are we representing different things? Um, and I'd say any number of these could be the case. Um, if nothing else, I would say that if you've, depending on how long anyone has been following competition climbing for, this will help inform this like next part. But like, let's say you've only been really following competition climbing since like 2019 or 2020 in the U.S., then Unfortunately, you've only got to really see our high level events in climbing gyms. Prior to that, you were seeing our events being held at very large scale convention centers. So like for both youth and adult nationals. So that alone with like having like this big wall that is shipped in with holds that are shipped in with like even the camera angle, like you, you're not like when you see a camera angle, it's like the wall and then the backlighting and the judges and the audience, right? Like if you look back at, I don't know, Madison, Wisconsin, 2016 adult bouldering nationals, you know, okay. You'll see like dated holds maybe, and maybe in the movement styles are a little bit more like OG, but the feel you'll be like, Oh, this is like a presentation. Like they're, they've created an environment here. Um, whereas for like a trillion reasons that, take a whole other three hour conversation to get through music climbing has shifted things uh quite a bit and now you see our nationals like i think last you know the last couple years they're being held at at uh commercial climbing gyms and so i think that does if if all other things are held equal that feel is a little bit lost you know that like presentation is a little bit lost because you know you're seeing like these like super high-end climbs being put on commercial climbing walls and i don't know what it is but like maybe maybe if you look back or like anyone who's listening like looks back you might be able to identify what that looks like for yourself because i know i know i see it and i feel it but maybe that's just like 
me as like a root setter who's been kind of on both sides of the coin there. Um, and I, with the IFSC, you see like a very, like if it's a World Cup, you see a very, very pointed um, and concerted effort by the event organizers and the IFSC to create this like exceptionally high quality competition environment. Um, so if nothing else, I think you notice that. That'd be my guess. But you're probably noticing other things as well. Hold sponsors are different, right? Volume sponsors, the root setting yeah, teams are different. True. Flavor of climbing is maybe maybe favored here or there a little bit more. So So you don't like explicitly go into a comp thinking that you'll set maybe like something more powerful for a national competition versus like something more flashy for a world cup. No, but I think I think that's a good point. I think it that happens naturally. Because like there's certain styles of moves and certain th- certain aspects of climbing that like whether we like it or not, they're just gonna it's it's gonna be really hard to represent at a lower level. I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I referenced this comp earlier, like Maringen, I think it was 2021 or 2022. There was, it was like one of the first years where they released these, like the cheetah, um, uh, ball volumes. They're like these orange slices basically. And they're like, as you build them out or as you like stack them, they build out of the wall. Anyways, they, Mm. they kind of unveiled them there. If my memory serves and they set this like, I don't know, penta paddle across the wall with like black volumes and blue holds and all these athletes are, or maybe it was even like six paddles. I don't know. I just remember seeing just like flying with these athletes. Just, it just looked like, like a, like a gif that was just like perfectly edited, you know, where there's just like constantly mm-hmm. hand moves like going like this and you just seemingly like never mm-hmm. stop. Like, I don't, I just don't know if there's a world where you can represent that really well in a youth nationals or an NACS Mm -hmm. and still meet the needs of the event. You know, maybe there's an athlete who could do that. Cool. But like that athlete's going to perform on every other style as well. If they're that far above and beyond, they're going to perform well at other things as well. So maybe then as root setters, we could do a better job at like allowing the rest of the field to perform, to compete, to show their skills and not just smash them and then make this the, you know, little Timmy show or whatever it is, you know, like, so I think at, at the highest level, you can really, really push those things. Cause those athletes are the highest level athlete. Okay. That makes sense. Good explanation. Okay. Let's uh, move on to your personal gym pursuit that's coming up. Um, you are starting up your own gym. Where are you in the process of that? And also how long has it been? Cause I, f- you made it sound earlier. Like it's, it's been a really long time in my mind. It's been a really long time. <laughs> Basically when I, when I'm up here, like where we're at, it's uh, it's like, an, I don't know. It's like an hour South of Boston and an hour East of Providence. That's kind of how I'm describing it to folks who aren't from around here. Uh, it's like Southeastern Massachusetts, not quite Cape Cod. Um, it, but it's like a climbing dead zone. There's just like not climbing around here, both outdoor. There's some outdoor. If you, if you drive a bit, um, indoor it's there's nothing there's nothing down the cape as you approach boston there's increasingly some climbing and as you approach providence there's increasingly some but um you know if i'm being as objective as i can not as a gym owner uh or soon to be gym owner the quality of the gym experience is lacking tremendously even at the gyms that exist that are up to, you know, an hour plus away. So I would, you know, drive to these places and I'm like, God damn it. I'm like spending all day getting stuck in traffic, fighting, spending, you know, $30 on a day pass and like climbing on these, in these environments that I'm just like not inspired by at all. And, but why is it that I go to, I go to Southern California, I go to Miami, I go to, I go to Houston, you know, wherever I go to anywhere. And like, they, they're pushing and there's a lot of reasons for that, I think. But I was like, all right, I'm tired of, I'm tired of coming home and not climbing, you know? Cause I just, I, I, I got to a point where I just refused. I was just like, you know, I'm done. I'm not driving an, an hour, an hour and a half each way to 
to do this. Um, so yeah, we open we I created this like concept, and then I you know was talking to my wife about it, and I was talking to my partners who are now partners about it, and so you know we've we were kind of flirting with the idea for a while, like ah this could be cool, blah blah blah, blah. maybe we'll do a co-op, maybe we'll do even just like something small, and then you know all things kind of came together, and we were like okay let's like make an actual bouldering gym, and so and depending on what you're timeline you're actually looking at i mean we didn't sign the lease on our space until november of last year so it's only been a couple months and we've been building out since uh we've finalized the design process um so all the angles are fixed and the walls are looking sharp and um even the interior like just moving right along painting and repairs and all, all that kind of stuff because it's in an old bank it's in a bank from the 1800s whoa yeah yeah it's pretty pretty wild it's a really unique looking space like if you look at it from the outside you're like there's no way as a climbing gym it's like a huge cut quarried granite that was shipped in like the interior is all like this yellow cream marble that was shipped in from italy in the 1800s it's like Jeez. brass fixtures and like uh, mahogany yeah in the climbing gym there's like fireplaces in every room super cool what yeah 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 yeah. it's it's wild so we're cruising we're chugging right along um we're hoping to be open by may june um oh, maybe that's, that's a bit yeah i mean maybe it's a bit um ambitious but it really just depends on um the city making like signing off on our plans basically and the city in particular this one is a little can be difficult sometimes for weird reasons and then um engineering because it is such a old space just making sure that the floors are going to support the uplift loads for you know the angles and stuff but we have strategies if certain things don't go the way we want it just they could take longer is all um, so if nothing else i mean yeah summertime be open um be like a little over 3,000 square feet of space, 3,200. Um, I designed the walls and picked out the holds myself and um, kind of ha- have a combo basically of kind of like, you know, your old school New England climbing because um, there's a huge amount of people who are like very attached to that, but okay. also yeah, provide yeah. opportunities for like this newer age of climbing and root setting experience for folks. Um, and offering that in our commercial day-to-day setting, but also, you know, bringing in athletes and teams from around. So, um, like I was talking with Natalia the other day, and we're going to be working together for a couple of things and kind of in her preparation to Paris. Um, and depending on timeline and a trillion other things, who knows, like I'll try to get her in and run like right when we open, you know, run like a, her and maybe Jesse through a workshop or a simulation or something like that. So providing the resources to kind of do all the things Um, because I want people to be able to like a lot of times, especially around here, you know, if they have a cool set of holds, cool set of fiberglass or volumes, they get like earmarked for like V8 and up or something. But the general climbing community might be climbing V4 or V5. And so my concept was like, I want people who climb V2 to have like the coolest holds and volumes to like, play on and explore and learn and like because look at the re- repeatability for that like no matter what you climb you always need to warm up or you should be warming up so like you're going to climb that v2 again but then the people who are projecting that can climb it the people who climb v3 you're going to climb it. you know what i mean like so investing really in like all levels of the community and not just like cutting corners because like traditionally that's what we've done i don't know trying to like push it push it a little bit yeah i mean it's always good to keep like beginners in mind and setting attractive boulders for beginners as well. Um, What are your favorite parts of the gym that kind of set it apart for you? Or like sometimes when I walk into like a friend's new house or something, I just want to know like what quirks of their house or apartment they really like. So what is that for you in this gym? I think it's all the the strangeness of the the old build like so it was an old federal reserve bank like i was i think it was built in like 1896 
um, you know, like huge granite blocks, wrought iron steel. Um, there's stained glass windows inside. I was mentioning the marble, like all the fixtures are like kind of grand. It was like a lot of it was renovated in the twenties. So it's like this art deco feel 39 foot clear height ceilings. There's uh, mosaic work on the floor. There's like white marble tile on the floor. Like, you know what I mean? It's just like, it's just like crazy. It almost feels like a museum, you know, but like, we're going to put new age climbing in there. And so I don't know. I just want, I want it to be a place. And I think it'll be a place where people like, generally can just like go and like hang out you know and like yeah you want to climb a little bit cool but you can just like hang out with your buddies um get a coffee and like see what's up and kind of be that like communal watering hole but then also have all the amenities of people who want to like train and get stronger too like we're gonna have a boardroom which funny enough is in like a previous conference board room that has like these you know chandeliers and you know like i said like multiple stained glass windows and um huge fireplaces and stuff and like put you know a kilter board in there like we're like we're building our kilter board like i was just building it two days ago and then uh you know put all all of your like training tools like there will never be a lack of training tools you know like whatever hang boards that you we want or certain types of edges or like tension blocks or weight vests, you know, provide all the things for whatever type of climber that you want to be or that you are, are here, but create an environment that you like general, genuinely want to be around. It's not like, well, I got to go to the gym to get strong, to go send the project outside. It's like, no, actually like, I kind of like hanging out here. Like that's what I want. I want people to like have that authentic climbing community and experience. So, um, that part's cool. And, and the location is like pretty special too. So like in this historic district of uh, the city that um, so the city is New Bedford, Massachusetts. And at one time was the um, wealthiest city in the world. It was the golden city. They called it. It's uh, it was the whaling capital, whaling capital of the world. So back in the whaling days, so it's got all this like super cool history from like whaling and like those kind of old times um all still accentuated throughout the downtown area with cobblestone streets and like huge old lamp posts and stuff like that so even if you like had a morning session or something like that or an afternoon session you could like go down go down the street and like walk down to the wharf and like catch a ferry to martha's vineyard or something like that or like go get some like food from these like really cool unique restaurants that are nearby and like all these like old bars and i don't know it just like has like a cool vibe that you could like go s- explore and and learn a lot too also so those are the quirks i guess sounds like a super cool space i'll yeah. have to check it out um do you like care about cafes in the gym or like yoga or i don't know what else do people look for yeah i love um, all that stuff i'm super into like yeah. cafes and bars and stuff in gyms like the more euro style um for better mm. or for worse I think, I think for better, uh, we do not have that in our gym because literally across the street, like right across the street, we have this like long standing cafe. That's very popular. Um, so Mm -hmm. like, yeah, you like walk across two lanes and you're at the cafe. Um, and then for bars and drinks and stuff, like doesn't matter which direction you go in. There's like restaurants, foods, bars, depending if you want Mm -hmm. like a low key kind of divey experience or you want to like get bougie and like, you know, whatever, like dress up afterwards, like any, in the whole range, like truly, um, you want live music, you want DJ, you want quiet, you want like outdoor patio, you want upstairs downstairs. you know what I mean? Like there's just so many places you could go. Um, wow. so it, we didn't feel like a need to really force that in our own space. And we'd rather mm-hmm. use that space for more climbing and, and all that. And then as far as like yoga and stuff, yeah. same thing, there's a yoga and bar studio one block away that's like pretty mm-hmm. prominent in the area. So again, like I don't, we don't need to we'd rather like bolster the community and not feel like we need to like try to pull and take from those folks. Like they've been here for a long time. They're doing a good thing. I'm not going to step on your toes, you know, like just do your thing. And hopefully we could have some like cross pollination, you know, maybe some yogis want to start climbing. Maybe some climbers want to start some yoga. Um, it's all good for me. That makes sense. I mean, I think a lot of times uh, climbing gyms are in locations where it's like a, a an old business park or like mm. 
warehouses. So it's nice to have those built in, but it sounds like you're in a really prime location. Yeah, it's kind of bananas. There's a, for the past like 45 years, the city has been trying to get this train, uh, train station. It's like, it'd be like the termination for this North to South, um, Boston regional transit. So in Bo- the Boston area, it's called the T, the MBTA. And that does like, you know, if you're in Boston proper or just outside, it'll do all the normal train things. But there's a regional train that will run like to a point. It'll run just just so far north and just so far south. But then there's like these communities that are just outside of that, that are like for years have been like, guys, give us the fucking train because we have the people we have. All these people are commuting every day to work anyways to Boston. So finally, I don't know what gave, but uh, they're expanding, I think, the north and the south terminus points. And so New Bedford, about one mile or maybe not even a mile, quarter of a mile from where we're at, will have this stop. So now I'm, I feel very certain that like the, the whole economic growth for the area is going to increase because people will be like, oh, I can live here now and just like hop on the train and go work in Boston. Or people in Boston will be like, oh, cool, I'm going to go hang out down in New Bedford for the weekend and go climbing. You know, like it just opens up the possibilities for, for everybody um, and just kind of allow folks to more easily access you know, different parts of the state. Sounds cool. I can't wait for it to open. I'll let people know. I don't know anyone who lives in Massachusetts, I think, but... If I do, I'll let them know. Thanks. Yeah, we'll be doing lots of projects and stuff too, like workshops, training camps, all that kind of thing. So mm-hmm. um, it might even be a opportunity for folks who don't live like super close by to like maybe make an investment to come visit for whatever project that we're working on. Oh, definitely. You know. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can start moving into Discord questions from the community. Um, I had one that was about the gym, so we'll just get into that one right now. Um, what's the difference between setting for World Cups compared to setting comp-style boulders in a gym? Definitely the... the I mean, uh, other than difficulty, the, obviously. <laughs> yeah, the field, like the field, of, the field of play, or not the field of play, but the field, like who are we setting for? So like it's, it's a broad field versus a narrow field. So broad field is like your commercial, even if it's for like a World Cup style climb, it needs to be accessible for a greater range of people. A greater range of body sizes, greater range of experience. Mm. Whereas a World Cup, I'm like, cool. Who's uh, who's in finals? All right, that's our minimum in terms of height. That's our maximum in terms of height and reach. Up okay. oh, here's where they're like, here's where they excel. Here's where they have difficulty. Here's previous rounds of performance. Oh, they're tired. Oh, they're feeling great. Right? It's like hyper calibrated typically at higher levels of climbing, just because we have more information. Like there's more quantitative information that we can pull from. And it's for this moment in time right now. This is, this is occurring at this, this moment. Whereas like, you know, you said a world cup style climb at the gym, you have more things you need to just kind of like, uh, caretake for, and typically provide more opportunities for play and experience and success, um, within those things. So, that'd probably be the biggest the biggest differential but it's cool because you can still play with those things and represent climbing movements and styles that you've seen at at high level events as well do you have to think about like safety a bit more maybe i would say i'd say that's a fair point i mean i never i personally this is just small potatoes but i never say safety i always say like risk management just just to be just to be like because like i mean no matter what like even if you have like a really experienced climber like shit happens you know what i mean but um yeah i think like people's own ability to like self-manage their risk i feel like there's probably a phrase for it um and i think there is and i just can't think of it but like if you're a high performing athlete right we can ask a lot of you and you can self-assess your risk and then if something goes wrong you're likely to know how to deal with it in time and space so you it's actually less risky quote quote you know what i mean or like but like if you put a similar version of a thing on the wall for um a less experienced climber they're almost like depending on depending on where they're at and who they are 
they might self-assess themselves to be greater at the thing than they actually are, but not have the requisite skills, uh, skills to like get themselves out of jail, so to speak, if they fuck up. And so they're actually like way more prone to risk because they're like, oh, this isn't so bad. You're like, hold my beer, watch this. And then like they're getting way over their head unknowingly so um, and then are more likely to get injured and have the severity be higher. That's just my like feeling on it. But like, so yeah, you have to calibrate that quite a bit to make sure that you're like doing your best to not I don't know you don't want to see people get hurt and I'm out of the instance but you gotta be more careful in the commercial environment if for nothing else there's more people there's more people climbing on it true yeah yeah that makes it hard as well but yeah I guess that's more of like a, a body awareness kind of thing maybe yeah yeah I think so uh next one what's your favorite round I guess probably in world cups gender and qualities versus semis versus finals um, what's your favorite round of those to set for and why? <laughs> I think, I think, I mean, maybe this is expected, but I think finals for, for any, for any gender though. I don't, I don't have a preference on setting for male or female. They're both like super fun. Like, I, I don't know. They both like each group can do an incredible amount of fantastic moves and crazy things. So like some of the boulders this year that I was like, had a highest affinity for, or might've been for like a women's semis, you know, but then others might be like men's finals. But I think on the whole, I really like finals because it's like, you know, it's this moment, you know, everyone's in, you know, together and everyone's watching and, you know, the drinks are flowing, the music's going, it's like this crazy, you know, feeling and the atmosphere. And it's like, all right, it all comes down to this, like to these four boulders and, um, you know, the announcer and the DJ and like, I don't know, it just like feels very exciting. And so when you're setting, you're kind of like, it's, it's sometimes hard. You like forget like during the setting week, you're like, Oh wait, like this is going to happen in this way. And then everyone filters in and you're like, Holy shit. Like, yeah, that's right. That's what this was for. Um, so I think, yeah, maybe something like that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, that's not like too obvious of an answer. Like, obviously, while you're setting, not all of that is going on. So it's like not, I don't know if you feel that energy while you're setting finals boulders versus if it all feels the same to you. So yeah, I think that's totally fine. Okay. Um, what are the top mistakes setters make in commercial setting and how do you avoid these? Probably a, a lot of them are soft skill driven um communication or lack thereof feedback or lack thereof understanding how to work with your team or lack thereof <laughs> um i think those are some of the biggest because like i don't know like regardless of your setting ability like i don't know if you've have you ever set before like you oh, yourself no it's not for me <laughs> but like okay so like but like conceptually right like i could fly to Southern California or wherever you're at and be like, all right, Ginny, like, here's what we're going to do. Like, here's some holds, here's some bolts, here's how they attach. And here's like some, just some pointers. So that way, like you can just move forward and like, you could set a climb, you know what I mean? Like anyone can do it. It's like in that regard, it's like zero, zero barrier to entry. You just have to want to do it. Whether or not it's going to be good or bad or whatever. Like if I said like, Ginny set me a ladder to get from bottom to top, at the very least, you could pick out the biggest jugs, put them in a horizontal line, and those hands would then become feet, and then you'd get to the top of the wall, right? So, like, when it comes to that, like, there's no mistakes. It's just, like, your choices of how to, like, attach things to the wall. And commercially, there's, like, such a diverse group of people who are climbing on your climbs that, like, inevitably, there's going to be people who like or dislike or love or hate or, or whatever up, about your climbs. So, it's, like... So then what really matters is like, well, how, how are you working with your team? How are you working with your company, with your, like all the, like, are you showing up on time? You know what I mean? Or are you like being lazy or are you always, are always the person who's like rushing around to like help others? You know, like those are like massive wins or losses, depending on what you're doing. Um, if you're always that person who's like willing to lend a hand and provide good feedback, even when the feedback isn't like good, and it's constructive. Like, are you able to provide that feedback constructively in a way that the other person receives it well? Because different people d receive feedback differently. 
that's like a fact of life, you know? Um, so can you, can you calibrate for that? Like that's massive. Um, and then having the longevity, you know, like knowing when, like I was saying, when to turn it on, when to turn it off, knowing your own body, knowing your own mind, um, being able to like do it day in and day out. It's, it's not just setting for a day, you know, it's setting, if it's commercially, it's like setting for a life, it's setting for a salary, it's setting for your family, you know, cause you're providing and you're getting compensated in some way. Um, so you need to make sure that it's, you have this ability to continue um, if that is your goal. So I think managing that is quite important. Yeah, I did like a setting clinic once, uh, just like an intro, just to try it out. Um, yeah, definitely was not for me. <laughs> I like put something <laughs> up, uh, hated it. Um, I think uh, Flannery was leading that clinic. Oh, nice. Knew. I love Flan. Flynn and I get to talk quite a lot. We're, we're both on the resetting committee, so we, we chat quite a bit on different projects and um, trying to get them to come up with me to, to Montreal in the next couple months and do a big clinic up there. So, yeah, Flynn's, Flynn's awesome. 10 out of 10. Really good clinic, but, yeah, I just, I just couldn't do it. I was, like, <laughs> I was talking to them about the climb, and I was, like, about to cry. It was so oh, bad. No. I was, like, so <laughs> upset. And then at the end, they were asking, like, oh, does, like, would everyone want to, like, try setting again or, like, have interest in it? And, like, everyone raised their hand except for me. <laughs> I was like, I don't <laughs> yeah, it's too much. It's a lot. It's a lot. And you're always putting your heart on your sleeve, but you're putting your heart on a sleeve in a way that's, like, kinesthetic that everyone is grabbing, whether or not you want them to. You know, you have to show it, and everyone gets to touch it and beat on it and love it and hate it. And, um, yeah, it can be, it can, if nothing else it can be like an emotionally demanding profession for sure. Yeah. Emotionally, physically, it was everything. It was also just like, I'm not, I'm still like trying to get stronger and it was so physically exhausting that it just wouldn't let me like climb after. Yeah. That's a, super fair point a lot of people forget that aspect of it it's like oh why didn't the setter just like just do that and it's like that setter probably made that tweak at like hours you know the seventh hour of the day out of eight and it's a thursday and they've been here since monday like maybe they were just exhausted and they just like didn't see it because they're so tired you know um, it's kind of like that personification of the products that were you know it's it's a balance because on one hand if you're a member of a climbing gym you're like I don't care your excuse, like give me the product that I pay for, you know, cause that's fair. Cause you're like paying a premium depending, especially where you're at. Like if you're in California, there's a lot of gyms that you can vote for with your money. You know what I mean? So like you want the highest caliber of the thing, but then the other side of it is like, well, it's people creating this thing for you to, you know, experience. Um, so maybe have sometimes having a little bit of a understanding of that can go quite a long way too. Yeah, it's just this constant back and forth, you know? Yeah, there's a lot to it. Um, but yeah, back to the questions. Um, this was from a previous guest, a paraclimber. Um, will there be any facilities in your gym for the paraclimbing community? That's a great question. And I'll be honest, I so everything, I mean, this is the minimum, of course. So, I mean, everything will be ADA compliant. Um, cause it has to be, so that's not, I'm not going to be like, Oh yeah, look at us. Um, but I don't, I don't know really much about paraclimbing. Uh, I'll be the first to say that, but thankfully, um, some of my closest friends, uh, either have been, are, or will be chiefs for paranationals and also run a lot of para events. So that's a great, really great question that frankly, I haven't thought about, uh, throughout this process right now i've kind of been thinking about like a lot of the like just like wall design and stuff like that i haven't thought about the other stuff but that's like a really 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 good question that now i'm gonna probably make some phone calls after this or some text messages and be like hey <laughs> what can we do to make this more accessible i mean some cool things that, like we have elevators throughout all of the facility so like that's that's cool. No matter if you want to go train upstairs, you want to train downstairs. Um, but as far as like specific setting for para athletes, um, I hadn't honestly, just frankly, I hadn't considered that. Um, 
especially up here, I, don't, I haven't noticed any ad, advocacy for it. But now that's actually probably a, I mean, it's got to be a massive community up here that's underserved, right? That would just stand to reason. Um, so whoever that climber is, thank you for that. Um, now you got my wheels turning. <laughs> so we, I don't know, I don't know what we don't know yet, but I do know that we will absolutely, like I can tell you, we're going to put our best foot forward with that. And I'm going to, so it's like Aaron Davis and, uh, Noel Heckle and Miles West, Kenny Benson, like all these folks are, uh, and, and, uh, woman Mia DePaulis, like they're all, you know, nationals, uh, paranationals setters and stuff like that. And then also have some, typically some personal connection to the para world, whether that's family members or friends or something like that. So, um, I'm going to get some advice on that. Yeah, that was, uh, Anita Agarwal, but yeah, maybe you'll see if there's a community up there or maybe you'll start the community up there. Yeah, that's an awesome idea. Awesome. Okay. Um, two more. Uh, so which athlete is the hardest to set for or type of climber is hardest to set for? Um, they said, I'm assuming Yanya is somewhere at the top of that list. <laughs> I feel like Yanya is easy to set for because she's just going to do it. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not like easy to set for. That's maybe I'm like a misnomer, but like you never like, you never really like worried if whether or not, like if, if we're like ever worried, like, I don't know if someone's going to do that boulder. And if Yanya is competing, we are like, well, Yanya is just going to do it. I don't know. Hardest athlete to set for. I think it's just probably mostly when you get some of the extremes in terms of body size in like finals, because there is, and I mean, we talked about Innsbruck a little bit. Um, there isn't, there wasn't, any like super because i don't think stasha made finals like stasha is the tallest girl i think or oceana um so if you have like one of them and let's say i in finals you're like fuck that's hard because you just like you know you want to represent all the styles and all the things we talked about today and also like what is the experience differential for them on this move versus this move versus this zone versus this top and then you again balance in the optics of it you balance in their own personal performance um it's it's quite difficult same thing on the men's side um if you have this one's a little bit maybe easier sometimes like if you have saratu versus like mechi um i always say their names i don't pronounce their names right so i'm sorry but i need, I need to get better i know there's like some accent there but um the nice thing is is that like saratu is so fucking strong that like just given any inkling of opportunity he's going to like find a way through it so it almost is like a little bit of a setter get out of jail free to some degree as long as it's not like a completely statically static tension demanding position where you like the only way to do this move is if you keep all these three points of contact on as long as you avoid that then like or you avoid the situation where some like someone super tall like Adam or Mechi can just reach and get his own. As long as you avoid those two things, like otherwise you kind of can play a little bit more. Um, just because like like I was saying, like Saratu is good at every style. He's good at the jumps. He's good at the slab. He's good at the tech. He's good at the swings. He's like he's just good. Whereas like you know, I is an amazing athlete, but she definitely has more of a. Uh, gradient of like style preference yeah like her strengths are incredibly strong and her weaknesses are quite weak but they also fall in line a lot of times i feel like with her size and so it can feel even more challenging at times um so yeah i'd say it has nothing to do with the tallest or the strongest or the weakest it's like when you get them in some sort of order for a finals that's that can be where it's tricky when there's a massive discrepancy in those things as is when it gets you just have to have, have a much finer tooth comb and even with the finer tooth comb you're more likely to make a mistake so it sounds like someone who's overall good at everything is just just the easiest person don't even have to it's really great consider. i mean yeah if you there the chances are high that the boulders all get done i mean even if you get if you're like oh wow this boulder felt really hard like She's just really good, you know. So chances are she's going to do it. I guess maybe the asker was wondering if it's hard to set for her because 
a lot of times after when she gets interviewed, she's always like, oh, it like, wasn't that interesting or it wasn't good yeah. enough. I think she has she handles herself really well in those situations because you can see it that she wants to like push more and try more. You saw her after burn. Uh, she like flashed every boulder in like the world championships finals just did so well. And everyone else like struggled. Everyone else was a performance. Everyone else. It was like a battle and she just, just all the way. Um, and it, you know, in some ways you're like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't, I don't know what to do about you. Like you're winning in casual style time in and time out, but it's like not just, respectfully it's not just about you there's five other women in your field just for finals or there's 19 other women in the semis who also would like a chance to perform and a chance to succeed and showcase their skills and even and and then sometimes sometimes as we know there is still a chance for Anya to make a mistake and that athlete to perform through so just as much as we're not always setting you know, for any one specific style, we're never setting for one specific climber. So we just have to like open the doors of possibility for everyone and allow them themselves to, to shine through. Okay. Making it to the last question. Um, you kind of touched on this a little, but how much do you think setters are able to sway rounds for particular athletes? And are there any current safeguards or, oh, are the current safeguards enough or is bias setting going to be a problem in the next few years? Um, I'd say the safeguards are like, like every setter, like if we're talking about like IFSC stuff, every setter is coming from a different country or just about like, there's no way like it's, everything is so communal. Like, okay, Ginny sets a boulder. Great. And if let's say Ginny was a terrible human being (laughs) and just said, I really want so-and-so to win. Uh, if she really knew so and so, yeah, <laughs> yeah like if you knew their style and there was some way, like I mean, I I guess that you could try to do that, but then but then the small group would come over because usually come over with like another group of like two or three or four people, and then we would make give you feedback, and you can't just say no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way, <laughs> you know, you can't just be like no, fuck you, we're not doing that. Um, it's so much more collaborative. And then the chief has to, you know, check mark the boulder. And then like, it'd just be so excruciatingly obvious to anyone on the setting team that that was the case that like, we'd be like, no, like this isn't hap- happening. Like it's not, I don't know. Like it, to me, it's just like so far away from a possibility. But the funny thing is, is that that person who's asking this question is right. Like in, in theory, there's like really no other world where like people can create this field of play that performance is then kind of judged on. I mean, maybe you have like skiing, like, or snowboarding in some instances. I mean, if like golf might be the closest thing, if golf courses changed, but golf courses don't change, you know what I mean? But like in theory, like they, someone's creating them, right? Like you have a golf course, I don't know what they call them, like a designer creator. And like, they're the ones determining how long is the drive going to be? How many, what's the par supposed to be? What is our tree situation looking like in terms of obstacles? What about bunkers? What about water features? What about slope? How, what's the grass depth and thickness? You know what I mean? Like all these things, like they have this play in a very similar way to that we have play, but like Pebble Beach is Pebble Beach every year. Augusta is Augusta every year. So um, in any case, I guess my point being is those, the, the safeguards are like built in due to the diversity of the team. I think you could run into the risk of like, let's say you had a, an entirely fill in the blank country team, maybe, but even then I, I don't think anyone like no one athlete is going to be worth someone's entire career. You know, like I'm never, I would never do that because I've spent nearly 20 years of my life trying to create a career for myself. Like I don't like, I, I, yeah, I, I want to see everyone succeed. I want people to win and fight, but I'm not going to like, I don't know. It just to me seems crazy. So um, the first part of the question though was how much do you think setters are able to sway around for particular athletes? I mean, I think if, if I think anything's possible to the same points that I was just kind of making is that like you could, I, I, it would have to really be a situation where climber, a climber was a hyper specific stylistic climber. You know what I mean? Like their strengths were so far and outside of other people's strengths 
You know what I mean? And they're like to where you could even create this possibility. I'm just talking about theory here. Like if someone was just so far above and uh, above and beyond at jumps compared to the rest of their field. And then you made it so that everything was just the same style of jump. Then maybe, but again, like, but then honestly, at this level, the jury president would come over and be like, no, no, we're not doing this. Like you're not having three, five arm paddle dinos back to back to back to back. You know what I mean? Like they'd just be like, no, like you have two hours, reset it and get it. Get it. Like that happened in Salt Lake. Not, not this version, but they like canceled the boulder in Salt Lake this year. There's three coaches. I think it was like three federations. We're like, no, we don't like that. And then the jury president was like, no, that's unsafe. So then they had to reset the boulder. Oh, wow. So you know what I mean? So like, they'll do it. So I, I just, I don't know. Like, it, it, it's it's the probably closest of possibility and the least likely to happen, if that makes sense. I think like the main one that people think of is like, like French climbers are supremely good at slabs. Mm. I think that's like the main one that comes to people's sure. minds. I think that's a... Uh, yeah, I mean, then a lot of times people say like, "Oh, American climbers are just really good at like thuggy pinches and steep stuff." And it's mm-hmm. like maybe yeah. historically that was the case, and I think there probably are some still some feelings on that. A lot of that, I think, a lot of that is driven by commercial climbing. Actually, uh, if you look around in gyms around the U.S., how many slabs do you really see? How many like twelve foot, fourteen foot long slabs that are four, five, six degree angled slabs? Do you see where you are like truly? truly slab climbing probably not many um yeah so it's kind of like yeah maybe the french climbers they train that because they realize yep we're really good at that they're really bad at that so when a slab comes up if it's going to come up 25 percent of the time in a round the chances are high that i'm going to smash and i need that advantage so naturally the other athletes should be saying the same thing and actually yoshiki this season, I, I talked with him a couple times. So I was hanging out with him in uh, Tokyo a bit. And then we did like a training camp in uh, Nuremberg. And, you know, just like kind of saw him. We were just kind of hanging out a little bit. And he was telling me like other athletes in between in between comps were like going to train like whatever you think of. Whenever, whenever you think of like climbing training, whether that's like fingerboarding and pull-ups and sit-ups or whatever. I don't know. Whatever you think of training. He, he would go to the gym like three to four days a week and just climb slabs for three hours a day. Cause he was like, I'm just not good on slabs. I just need to go climb slabs. And I'm just like, fuck yeah, dude, that is awesome. Like that is exactly what you should be doing, you know? Cause he, and then guess what? Some slabs came around and he did a great job. He did a really, really, really good job. So it's kind of hard in those level of environments where you can really favor athletes too much. Cause the field is just so competitive nowadays that, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know how I don't know how it'd be done. <laughs> Sounds good. I think that's quite comprehensive, and that's all the questions I had. Um, yeah, thank you so much for all the time. It was super interesting to get to know all this. Um, I know a lot of people were also really excited to hear about it, and they had a lot of questions. So hopefully, this this answers a lot. Um, anything else you want to shout out or let people know where they can find you? Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, if anyone ever has any questions and anything about like root setting or climbing or consultation stuff, like I said, I, it's kind of how I make my bread and butter, but even if it's just, you know, friendly, personal stuff, um, Instagram, I try to communicate people as much as I can through there. It's just at C It's just my first, first initial last name. And then my business account is syndicate root setting. Um, so I, I try to be up on both of those as much as possible. So if you kind of hit one or the other is fine. And then the climbing gym that we're opening is uh, called Boulder Union. Um, so of course, would love to invite everyone to, to come visit at some point in time. And but yeah, if you have any feedback for me or questions or anything, comments, concerns, ideas, thoughts, feelings, just give me a shout. Open book. Awesome. I'll leave all those links uh, in the description so people can take a look. And yeah, thank you again. It was an amazing talk. 
Awesome. Thank you so much, Jenny. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the podcast. Don't forget to like and subscribe if you enjoyed. Otherwise, you are a super fake climber. If you're listening on a podcasting platform, I'd appreciate if you rate it five stars and you can continue the discussion on the free competition climbing discord linked in the description. Thanks again for listening.